So this is the, the first meeting of, of the, the municipal year, but it's also the first meeting since the, the election. Um, and we've got some returning councillors and we've also got some new councillors. We didn't have a meeting at the end of the last year and there are a number, uh, a few of the councillors stepped down at that point. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you for the efforts that they had um, carried out, some of them for just one term, but um, three of the other ones were for more than one term. So they had spent a lot of time as a councillor in our area. So I'd just like to give a thanks to um, who were my fellow ward councillors in Surbiton Hill, um, Malcolm Self and Hilary Gander. In Berrylands, we had Shushila Abraham. And in um, Alexandra, we had Sam, Sam Folder Hughes. That's what I was about to say. Yes. <laughs> I hadn't forgotten. Uh, uh, so so I'm, hopefully I haven't forgotten anyone. But thank you, uh, Councillor Green, for keeping me right. Um, so so there are some. Um, so that, those are the ones that stepped down and are no longer with us. What I would like to say is to Surbiton Neighbourhood has changed. We had a, there was a boundary commission they looked at uh, all, the whole of the borough and they changed some of the ward boundaries and a result of that we then looked at uh, how that had been changed. We have some input into that but it's again it's at their dis discretion as to how um, they, they changed the wards. So now we have got um, and welcome uh, Tolworth Ward to, to Surbiton Neighbourhood. Previously it was Tolworth and Hook Rise and they were part of south of the borough. So I'd like to, to welcome them to, to the meeting this evening. Um, so I think if we want to, I might actually just, we're all sitting in ward order, so I think it might be good if we start actually um, at the far end. Um, Councillor Woodridge, would you like to introduce yourself and work around from there? Yeah, hi, I'm Andrew Wardridge from, from Tolworth. Hi, how do you do? Hi, I'm Mariana Gonsalves from Tolworth as well. Peter Hurlinger from Alexander. Yeah, Mandus from Alexandra Ward. And just want to point out, I'm not actually this height, it's just these tiny chairs. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. Yeah. Right, I'm Tom Reeve from uh, Surbiton Hill Ward. Hi, I'm, I'm Amir Ali Khan and uh, councillor for Surbiton Hill. I'm Councillor Jogan Joganada from St. Mark's uh, and Seething Wells. Thank you. Liz Green, St. Mark's and Seething Wells Ward. Diane White, also St. Mark's and Seething Wells Ward. Good evening, everyone. Anita Sharper, Berylands Ward. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jackie Davis, very loud, from Berylands too. Th th thank you, everyone. Um, we also have, um, we were supposed to have some more officers as one of the planning officers has actually um, tested for COVID today and isn't actually with us. Um, but we've got uh, Fiona Cotter from Democratic Services and we've got James Geach at the end, who is the Surbiton Neighbourhood Manager. Welcome. Um, so we've got uh, the first item we have, and at, at the end, at every uh, of every one of our meetings, we have 30 minutes where residents can come and ask questions. Um, and this evening, we have got some residents who would like to ask some questions. We have 30 minutes for this. So, so and there are a, a few people. We've we got additional ones there. That, or is that? I think these are all for the planning. These are all right. Okay. So, so actually. Oh, I thought there was maybe some. There's some more. Yes, I thought I thought somebody had asked me for them. If you can, we get the ones there because they're ones. I think they're questions rather yes. than. Yep. Yeah. Um, so, thank you. So the ones that have registered to speak. I don't know. Are you coming together or are you doing it individually, the three of you? Um, the problem is we've got one seat there. Did so you, so. You, only people who've registered by the deadline. We Liz and Alex and Thomas. They have to register for public questions by 10 a.m. Yeah. Well, I think I'm going to meet. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, do you want to come? Who wants to start? Um, do you want to come together or in? Okay. So we've got 
Liz Mitchell, Alex Oakes and Thomas Wareham who want to um, ask us some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. First of all, congratulations on your reappointment as chair and your reappointment as, as vice chair and everybody for their re-election or election. Um, thank you for giving us time to speak on this very important matter. Since the previous meeting of this committee in March 2022, us, the resident representatives of Torworth Road and Thornhill Road, have been meeting and discussing options to remove the unsustainable level of non-local through traffic in the whole neighbourhood. We have continued our combined efforts and present our questions together. Just to give a little background on, for those who are not already familiar with the situation, uh, a monitoring group was set up with representatives from the roads bound by Red Lion Road, Ewell Road, Ditton Road, Hook Road and the A3, which we can call the triangle maybe for ease of, uh, of use. The aim of the monitoring group was to discuss and review options for addressing the increasing traffic levels in the neighbourhood and to identify the best possible solution. After highway teams, councillors and locals poured over the maps, got feedback and played out scenarios, several options were presented at a meeting. Realising the fact that no one solution was absolutely perfect for everyone and recognising that there would be no silver bullet in solving the problem, it wasn't very easy. There would be an impact on journey times for people in, in the neighbourhood, but it was generally agreed that there, these would be worth it if it did reduce traffic for everyone. The primary source of traffic comes from two places. Firstly, non-locals exiting the A3 at Fuller's Way North and travelling along residential streets to get to Hook Road and onwards to Chessington and Surbiton. Secondly, non-locals driving from beyond Surbiton towards the Ace of Spades roundabout and cutting through residential roads to avoid the queue and get onto the A3. This traffic is not locals. It is not people who couldn't ride their bike or walk or catch public transport. It is people from other areas travelling a fair distance. The monitoring group voted on the various options presented by the council and representatives and the Kingston Council traffic engineer was instructed to take forward the two most favoured options. The second most voted option, or option five, was to go backwards by removing the existing modal filter on Tolworth Road and go back to the drawing board to find a holistic solution. The options with the most votes, option 1B, was to implement a couple of additional measures whilst retaining the modal filter on Tolworth Road, implemented, implemented under an ETMO in December 2021 and implemented by the South of the Borough Neighbourhood Committee, namely a bus gate on Thornhill Road and a modal filter on Denham Road. It was agreed that option 1B was the preferred option amongst those represented for mitigating traffic in the area. The use of ANPR was also discussed to enable residents of some of or all of the roads in the triangle to drive through the bus gate so as to minimise the impact on those residents. Now, it's worth remembering that in November 2021, according to data that the Council has gathered, we had an excess of over, we had over 3,800 vehicles driving east to west between Red Lion Road and Hook Road. And these figures were reportedly down, reportedly down by as much as 60% on usual levels due to COVID rules, which were at, at the time in force, but no longer are in force. Traffic data shows that already there has been a reduction in east to west traffic through the area. We would like to ask you, councillors and highways officers, the following questions. Which of these two options would result in the roads in this neighbourhood being safer for pedestrians and school children walking to local schools? Which of these two options would result in increasing the volume of traffic 
in the whole of the neighbourhood. Which of these two options would result in the roads in this neighbourhood being safer for cyclists? Which of these two options is more aligned to Kingston's climate change emergency strategies? Which of these two options is more likely to encourage local people to abandon their car for short journeys in favour of healthier options, such as walking, cycling or using public transport? Which of these two options would result in lower pollution levels due to a reduction in traffic throughout the neighbourhood? Which of these two options will have the greatest impact on deterring rat runners from using local roads? And which of these two options will encourage drivers to stay on those main roads, not use local roads, which are unsuitable for this, these high levels of traffic and these roads filled with children and cyclists? Which of these two options offers a significant enough deterrent for non-local traffic to avoid the area and stick to the main roads? Which of these two tr options offers a viable instant solution to the traffic problems in the area to be trialled under an ETMO? And finally, which of these two options is a move forward, not backwards, towards a holistic solution for the whole neighbourhood? We acknowledge that there are many roads in this area that experience problems with traffic. This is not just about two roads, it's about all roads in the neighbourhood. The aims of the mitigations suggested under option B are, one, to further reduce traffic everywhere in the neighbourhood by keeping non-local traffic on the A3 or encourage them to use alternative A road routes. Secondly, to reduce the impact on locals in terms of journey times. Thirdly, to create significant enough deterrent for sat-navs and drivers so they remain on the main roads. And finally, to make it safer for everyone who uses the roads. So in conclusion, option 1B seeks to resolve an existing, existing acute problem. With the introduction of ANPR technology, it could be the holistic solution as that would alleviate local traffic flow onto Red Lion Road and Fuller's Way North. It can be implemented under a temporary ETMO, during which time it can be ascertained the effectiveness. We therefore ask this committee to reflect on the many years of research and effort that has been put into solving the traffic problem in this residential area and choose a progressive solution towards a safer, cleaner and healthier neighbourhood. Thank, Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. You want to go back to your seat. Thank you. No, yeah, I'll, I'll just answer. Yeah. Can I ask? Sorry, I'll, I'll, I will just answer. Okay, uh, so I've taken it away. So, so as you know, and you've, you've summarised, um, there was was a meeting of um, a, a continuation of, of, of engagement with residents recently, which you've summarised what, what was the, the outcome of that meeting. But also, as as you know, there is it's an ongoing dialogue. People are still um, can still register their views online and can continue to do that up until our next meeting, when we're planning to look at this. In, in the round, so and they will come back to the, the councillors here to, to, to make a decision. Um, the officers will take it all away and, and come up with a recommendation, and, and then it will be up to the, the councillors whether they want to, to go with that or to have a, a, a different outcome, and that will be done at the July meeting. So, so thank you for those, all of those questions. Um, there is no one from the highways team here this evening because we've got no highways items on the agenda. But what, we, what I have um, will ask um, Fiona, if we can take it away, the highways team, I think you've, probably, you've submitted them already, so they are in the system. Um, the highways team will have a look at it. Um, they will either um, incorporate those, uh, the questions, uh, answers to it into the paper that's coming to the next committee, and, and if not, um, a separate response will be given to you uh, for that. All right, is that, is that good enough? Okay, well, thank, thank you very much for that. Um, we've also got um, two other greens. Right, okay, I've got Matt Reed. Would you like to come forward? Alex will come. Oh, do you want to come together? Will you? That's absolutely fine. So I've got uh, Matt Reed and Alex Mills. 
who also want to talk about Tolworth Road, low traffic neighbourhood. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so yeah, my name is Alex Mills. I'm from uh, Douglas Road, um, and as you say, this is in reference to the same topic. Um, so our questions are, why have the majority of roads, all of whom would be impacted by proposed um, measures, mitigation measures, not been consulted? In the last SNC, um, SNC meeting in March, Eunice Hamad said all residents would be consulted with a holistic view uh, would be taken. But the majority of Douglas Road wasn't even aware these conversations were taking place until only last week. The same goes for Ellerton Road, Tolworth Park Road, Tankerton Road, Ravenscar, to name a few. Hence why there has been no representation from any of them in these meetings to date. Even Tolworth Juniors and Infant School were not aware. Apparently letters were sent, but they obviously never made it to their intended addresses. In addition, why are conversations, or everyone's um, intrigued to know, why are conversations even taking place against, about mitigating against an increase in traffic on Thornhill, which is obviously the, the result of the displaced traffic caused by the implementation of the LTN on Tolworth Road, when it hasn't even been decided if the LTN will remain in place or not. Until that point, surely discussing and drawing up lots of suggested mitigation measures in it is in itself a waste of everyone's time, money and resource. My final point is that everyone on Douglas Road, and I'm sure a lot of the other residents on roads that haven't been consulted yet, so far seem vehemently against any of the mitigation measures that have been suggested, including option 1B, for many of the reasons actually Councillor Anita Shaper outlined in the March meeting, such as traffic simply being displaced from one residential road to another. Where do you stop with mitigation measures? Also, the fact that any changes affect thousands more res residents causing longer journey times and inconvenience to travel to and from your own house. Obviously more pollution, and in the case of Douglas Road and Tolworth Juniors and Infants, putting the lives of children at risk who have to navigate increased traffic volumes to get to school because the implementation of 1B would cause more traffic to go up and down Douglas Road. Um, surely, consulting with TfL, Highways England and Surrey County Council to implement a slip road from the A3 northbound to the Hook Roundabout is the only rational solution, especially when hundreds of flats and houses are due to be built by Tolworth Roundabout, where the traffic, traffic there will surely become unbearable. So we'll, our question is, will all, these, all the residents' views that have only obviously just come out to find out about all these uh, mitigation measures that are being discussed, will their views now be uh, taken into consideration before making that decision on the 19th of July? And, and please, can you tell us clearly how the residents can make their views known? So you're so, speaking, do you yeah, want no, to so add that, anything? I mean, or, or no, I mean, Alex, Alex has pretty much said it, but I mean, I'll just say as the, as the dad of two young boys on Douglas Road, I, I, can, I mean, we all, agree the, we all agree on the problem, right? The problem is there's too much through traffic. I think the problem at the moment is it's just a whack-a-mole strategy to try and shift it road by road. And actually the, the underlying purpose behind the LTN was stated as making it safer to walk and cycle. At the moment it's achieving the opposite. Now, I'm less comfortable sending my boys out to walk and cycle now than I was before. Well, th thank you um, for coming along. Um, I, I probably will just take away. Um, my understanding was, and, and I know things come through the door from the council um, that you might not, um, you know, might just end, uh, find his way into the recycling without actually mm -hmm. being bred. But I, my understanding is, and I will take it away um, and, and just check with officers that all of the roads. My understanding was that you should have got a letter about it. Um, I mean, sorry, the, I, know, I know that I know that can happen, but there, I mean, there's a group of 68 of us and only one person. Yeah, so, so that's why I will take it away um, because it's maybe too many people haven't got it. Um, but just to say that the, the, the meeting that we were talking about, which um, you, you were at at you were, I'm not sure. Um, the, so so the, the meeting, that, that, that was where we had um, the officers. It was during the election period and councillors couldn't be involved in it because we must um, um, step down from being a councillor and leave the officers to deal it in, in that period, the pre-election period. 
So that's where um, I'm not absolutely certain that was what was instructed, but we, they were the ones who selected. So you had to put your names forward if you wanted to be on that, and they selected a couple of people from each road to be represented. Um, I believe there were, uh, and again, the highways officers are not here this evening to, to confirm this, so I can take it, I will take that away. I believe there was someone from um, Douglas at the first one, and, and so, sorry, uh, yeah. Um, so, so I, I believe there was, but I, I and um, I'm not certain about the other roads that you mentioned. So that's why we'll need to, yeah. to take that away. But it was on the basis of those letters going out and people responding, and and then we mm. tried. They tried to select on a, a fair basis of you know for for um, a, a range of people to be their age groups mm. and. Um, gender etc so, so so that's what the, the reason that that was picked um, how, how people were picked to be part of that but that's only the start uh, that's only a, a part of the process as I, I mentioned to to the previous three people who spoke it's only part of the process and part of the the, the data that will go together along with the traffic data that will go to, towards the paper that will be coming by the highways team with a recommendation to the the, the next meeting um, you've mentioned about the a3 that is not within the Kingston Borough's um, gift. It's that we can liaise and consult with um, TFL and, and with Highways England and with um, Surrey Council for that matter because I think it's theirs as well. But we can only do that. And, and, they, and, and so that is something that we have always been doing. It's, it wasn't part of our ward, uh, uh, sorry, our neighbourhood before. It was, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, Tolworth and Hook Rise, that was, uh, uh, they, they were. Um, nearer to the, the A3, the spits that's um, involved. So, so they're now part of our, our neighbourhood and we will take it away um, and, and certainly be in, in communication. The office has already been in communication with TFL about looking at the options. So um, I'd say, yeah. and the, final, the other thing that you asked about was how can you make sure that your voices are heard? Well, the, the key thing is to respond to the online portal that, that has um, the Tolworth um, Low Traffic Neighbourhood um, site and, and registering there because you will then get up, any updates will be there and it will be coming to your email address. Um, in, in the main, um, they might send out some things by post, but in the main, I think it'll be email, um, and, and that will keep you up to date. So I would suggest that you um, do, you get your your um, neighbours to do that. I would also um, just do a, a little plug for it. Um, the the council also have a very good residents newsletter. Um, and I recommend it to lots of people. It's a very, very good residence newsletter which you can sign up to and it gives you updates on all the things that are going on in the whole borough, not just Surbiton, but in the whole borough. And, and I really do think it, it's, it's a, something that I would urge you to, to sign up to as well. Okay. I mean, I, I appreciate there were various communication channels and some of them may not have been fully effective during the election period. But the most concerning thing for me was that the school wasn't aware and the school is very good at communicating with the parents. Or the DVLA um, yeah. who are on Douglas Road. Okay, I, I have taken that away, um, and, and you know, we, 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 I will follow that up. Um, and and I say, if you're speaking to the school, then I would urge them to, to make some representations, either the Parent Teachers Association or, 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 or you know, so I would take it there. To the, so, all right, can thank you. leave it there. But thank you for coming along this evening. Okay, that, that's the, um, we haven't quite finished the 30 minutes yet. I didn't know if there was anyone else who wanted to complete a, um, a green slip and come and speak. I can see a hand you want to come and... Um, is it a question on, or is it on an item that's later on in the agenda? Well, we, that we will ask you to speak then. Um, that it's only where it's not on something to do with the agenda, any future agenda item. So, yes, we do have some other green slips for that, so um, that's fine. All right. So, uh, would you like to come forward? Uh, I, um, it's, it's residents, it's public questions. Yeah. In the first, if you could, if you could, ju we just would want to have um, yeah, your name, so that it's just for the records, yeah. really. So I that's, mean, it's two okay. very simple questions: is you're referring people to a consultation? I believe it closed on Tuesday, 
So has that been extended is my first question. Um, second question is, pray tell why our highways not here, when the submitted questions were about highways, and actually the agenda items, the one that's on the screen, seeks to bring even more traffic to the neighbourhood. So that, that to me is a very simple uh, bit of engagement that highways need to do, or someone else needs to do with highways. Okay, um, I can answer why highways um, officers will come on items that are to, to do with their area. So when they come next time with, um, with the item, the, the low traffic neighbourhood, or if there was a tra traffic management order, or something that had to be reported back for them, then they I would expect them to come. Um, when it's an item, a consultation item, uh, they, they wouldn't, I wouldn't expect them to come because we've got the applicant and there are other people who, uh, interested parties who would want to, to come and speak on that. We, we don't need to have the, the highways team for that. They, will, they should be as part of the process of looking at a planning application. It will be farmed out to all uh, various departments within the council, one of which would be the highways. With all due respect, they need to understand the neighbourhood more if they're going to make decisions. Go cycle, reducing Red Line Road down to one lane. Sorry, can you um, just let me finish? Yeah, I, I know that you're. Sorry, you're sound like you're. You know, uh, we just have to be um, have a process here of backwards and forwards, and and so I've given you an ex a, a reason why they're not here today, um, and I, I wouldn't expect officers to come just on um, the, the expectation that there might be something that they might answer. They will any of the questions that have come up today, they will take them away and answer them, and they will give a written response to, or it will be incorporated into the paper. But I wouldn't be expecting officers just to come along just in case there's going to be a question. So, and, and so this is a Surbiton neighbourhood meeting. It's a, a neighbourhood meeting of the councillors and, and we've got an agenda and, and we are here to, um, and giving you the first 30 minutes to come and ask questions, additional questions. Well, so, so, so this is, is a meeting of councillors which is in public but it's not a public meeting which is why I'm saying you can come and ask questions and I can answer them but you need to respect that I'm the chair of the meeting and that you you know you have to wait for me to respond and and then then come back to me so all right uh, thank uh, you very I much. I felt like I'd done that but okay. thank you very much <laughs> thank you all right Okay, so that, I think that's us uh, finished with uh, public questions. Um, if we move on to the next item on the agenda, which is petitions. Um, I believe we've got a petition to be submitted. Would you like to come forward? All right. And, and you've got two minutes to yeah, speak on it. We only will receive it. We won't be speaking on it just... And, and you've got two minutes. Yep. It will, if it will come... Once we're finished, it will come forward to a future meeting. Sure. Um, this petition is to make Thornhill Road safe. And the petition is that council to implement measures immediately to reduce the volume of traffic and speeding on Thornhill Road to make it safe for pedestrians and cyclists. So since the implementation of the Tolworth Road LTN, Thornhill Road has seen a significant increase in traffic. This is not new to councillors, as we have shared our videos and photos with you in the past. In terms of raw numbers, council traffic counts show that traffic has increased from 1,744 to 2,793 a day. That's a 60% increase at one end of the street and from 1,111 a day to 2,116, or a 90% increase at the other end of the road. With the increase in traffic, there are additional concerns about the safety, which we've heard about from other people here tonight, for road users, particularly those with young children, as they cross the road to get to and from school. Many of you will be aware that Alex and I presented a petition in March 2022 asking for mitigations to reduce the traffic on Thornhill Road. We have seen no changes. We had a one day on a weekend for a few hours where police attended the road and did some speed checks in a fluoro jacket. I have sought out the local PCSO for assistance, yet nothing has happened despite promises of an operation. Ty has also um, put our case forward as well. And the operation was not to target speeding, but we still haven't seen them. Council traffic counts show the extent of the speeding. Um, Alex is going to um, show you some graphs. 
In March, twice as many people speed as do 20 miles an hour or under at one end of the street. If you're talking about 2,000 plus cars a day, that's a lot of speeding. Um, or over 4,000 on a bad day. Sorry, um, Liz, that's two minutes up. Okay. It's, um, there will be more opportunities for you to speak um, uh, when it comes back to committee. Okay. Um, but we have to stick um, to, yep. to this. It's, it's, uh, so, sorry, thank you very much. Um, I don't know. Thank you very much. Um, so if we, um, we've received that um, petition and it will get taken away and will be passed uh, to, to the, the relevant, um, relevant department, um, it will, um, and, and then it will come back uh, with either a response or come, um, or come to this committee as part of a paper. Um, if we can go on to the next item on the agenda, which is uh, apologies. Actually, is it? Well, yes, apologies. It's the bottom of the page. Apologies for absence. Um, uh, so, are there any apologies, Fiona? Thank you, Chair. I have apologies for absence from Councillor Thai Thailan. Thank, thank you. Um, do we have uh, no, next item on the agenda is um, declaration of interest? Uh, do we have anything? Any declarations of interest, Councillors? Councillor Green. Uh, thank you. As a member of the planning committee, the two planning items that are coming forward will come to planning committee at some point in the future. So therefore, um, I will sit here and listen, but will not take part in the discussion. Uh, thank you. Um, Councillor White. Thank you very, very much. I am also on the planning committee, so I will listen uh, without contributing. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Um, I'm also on the planning committee, so I'll also take the same step as just listening. Okay, th thank you very much. Um, can I start going? Thank you. Um, I work for Savills, and I noticed that Savills is the agent for one of the planning applications. So it's the Red Line Industrial Estate application, and because of that, I'll leave the room when that happens. Th thank you. And, and you will leave the room, yes? Yes. You're okay. Okay, thank you. Because, yeah, thank you very much. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, if we can move on to the, the, the minutes and number items, um, item six is the minutes of previous meeting, can, which was on the 17th of March. Can, um, for those of us who were probably attending um, and returning, can we approve those as record, at record meeting? <laughs> yes. Okay, great. Thank you. And, and you're happy for me to sign them? Yeah, yes. thanks. Okay, um, then we move on to item seven. Um, I'm going to turn to uh, James Geach, our neighbourhood manager, who will introduce this item when we're looking at community grants and council award funding. I'm very pleased to be um, welcoming back um, someone that we gave our money, or some of our money to in the last uh, municipal year um, to hear about how you, how, what you've produced with, with that money. But um, I'll pass over to James to take it from there. Uh, thank you, Chair. As much as I'd like to think everyone's here to hear about the Community Grants Programme, I'm very conscious that people are interested in the two big planning applications we've got. So I, I promise I'll try to be succinct. Um, I'm here to present the grants paper, which is appended as Annex A to your report. Um, and the committee has essentially been asked to do two things this evening. It's been asked to consider its governance arrangements for council award funding, and has also uh, been given a chance to review um, the award of an application made last year on behalf of Community Brain to produce um, a, a walking guide leaflet. Um, if it's okay with you, Chair, although it's in the other way order in the agenda, I'd like to start with the second of those two things and talk about the walking guide. So those members who are returning will recall this was an award made last year. It's a neighbour community grant which the committee made to um, Community Brain to produce a walking guide between Tolworth, Malden Manor and Berylands. Uh, we're very lucky to be joined this evening by the applicant, Himadi, from the Community Brain, who's just going to take a few moments to talk through um, what's in the leaflet and how residents can find a copy. I do have a few copies here, Chair. That's probably enough for one between two, so I'll pass them along as Himali speaks. Thank you, James, and thank you, Himali. I'd like to just carry on. Thanks. <laughs> Hello. Oh, can you hear me? <laughs> uh, yes, so last year we applied for a neighborhood grant uh, for a new walking route between Tallworth, Molden Manor, and uh, Berrylands. Uh, so here is the map. 
Um, it uh, goes through several green spaces, so it goes through six acre me it starts at Tallworth Station, uh, goes through six acre meadows, uh, the, uh, the Hogsmill open space along the Hogsmill River, uh, through Elmbridge Meadows and uh, touches Molden Manor Station. You can end the walk there or you can keep walking ahead towards Berylin Station. Uh, and it highlights a lot of the local businesses around the area, lots of cafes and um, uh, the Sunray Recycling uh, Center. Uh, we also uh, designed this uh, walking route in collaboration with the Sunray Estate. So there was Janine and Simon from um, the Sunray Estate. Uh, all of the bi we've also highlighted the biodiversity that you can find along the route, and all of this information was uh, given to us by uh, Elliot Newton, who is the Kingston Council Biodiversity Officer. Um, so yes, and you can find these walking routes around libraries in Kingston. So the Kingston, Surbiton, Tallworth, uh, Hook and Chessing, uh, the Hook Center, um, yeah, and then uh, several other local businesses. Uh, we've mentioned lots of cafes, so you can find these in the cafes as well. And you can always come to our community space at Tallworth Station called Baking Ideas and the Farm of Futures, and you can always pick one up. And you can also download this. Uh, from our website, and you can find um, the the walking route on a walking app called Go Jointly. So yeah, it's easily available everywhere. Thank you, and and your enthusiasm for this is infectious. <laughs> and I would recommend anyone. <laughs> So I would recommend that you do do the walk. I've done this one um, uh, from Tolworth Station to, to Berrylands, but I've also done the other one, which Amali was working on, which was from Tolworth Station to Chessington. And, and I would highly recommend both of them as good walks. Um, I went with my dog, but um, you're with, uh, with young people, old people, uh, maybe it depends. It is a little, it's not always very easy to, you know, because it is, it is a map that, that, that Amali has done. It's not got signposts everywhere to, to follow, but I think it's a, a really a fabulous piece of, uh, fabulous document, and I would recommend, um, recommend you to have a look at it, and I'm really pleased that the, the councillors agreed to, to fund this. I don't, do any of the councillors want to say anything briefly? Yep. Councillor Yoganathan. I think I quite agree with what you said, uh, Chair. Uh, I, uh, as you know that uh, I'm actually, even though part of the Servitor sort of neighbourhood, but uh, I am as, assumed the responsibility as the first citizens of the Royal Borough. Uh, so I had to be careful. I know Himali very well indeed. My charitable trust is two of them. That is, one of them is Community Brian and Creative Youth, and she has done an excellent job in terms of lifting up the tall work and that particular area. And then we talk about so much about traffic and uh, using cycles and everything, so there you are, she has done it. And you, we used to play cricket and everything there, a bit, bit naughty when I was young. You have done an excellent job lifting the uh, Tolworth where we want to. But uh, thank you very much and please continue. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Councillor Manders. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, well, as the uh, portfolio holder with responsibility for the parks and open spaces, I'm very pleased to see this leaflet. Um, it reminds people um, about the wonderful facility that they have on their doorstep. Um, the only thing I would ask that the online version has an appeal for people to take their rubbish home with them. Uh, probably the people who read this and take it with them probably aren't the people who will litter, but I think it's useful to remind people. Thank you. Yes, that's a very good point, and, and sort of touches on the, the fact that the, this is a, a walk um, that you've come up with and p picking up on some sites, but it, it's not one that we've necessarily got waste bins as you go along. So yes, it would be a very good idea to take it home with you. So that's a good point. Well, well made. Thank you. Right. Um, on, on that note, um, I look forward to see everybody out doing the walk <laughs> at the weekend with this nice weather. Um, James, do you want to... Uh, Thank you for coming along, and, and do you want to carry on with the, the next bit? Yes, thank you, Chair. So um, the second um, question being asked of the committee this evening is how it would like to allocate this year's council award funding. Now, council award funding is one of the four parts of the community grants programme, and it's one which the council gets to determine its own working arrangements for each year. Um, so as set out in the report, um, 
This was first introduced in 2016-17 to provide local councils with the ability to provide flexible and timely amounts of small funding for local initiatives within your wards. Um, and the guidelines for the programme, as light as they are, have been appended as Annex 1. Um, the budget remain, remains the same as previous years, so that is set at £2,000 per councillor. Um, and the options are available to the committee are set out in paragraph two of the report. I'll just very quickly summarise each of those, Chair. There are three of them. Um, the first, uh, as set out in 2A, is allowing members to allocate council award funding in individually. Uh, this is how the programme first started and is the approach that all other neighbourhood committees have adopted, um, but one that Serbian hasn't used in the recent past. Um, the second option is set out at 2B. You can pull that entire uh, council award funding budget um, and you can use it as additional funding for neighbourhood community grants, the type of awards that the community brain received last year. Um, if you choose to do that, um, that additional funding in that NCG pot will be subject to all the terms and conditions of that grant system. Um, and the last option, Chair, is pooling the entire uh, council funding budget um, so it can be allocated rather than individually but by this committee. Um, there are um, a number of advantages and disadvantages to each of these options and they're laid out in the report. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Chair. Uh, th thank you, James, for that. And, and as I mentioned already, we have quite a few new councillors with us. Um, previously, we did pool our money together because we could, and, and we put it in within the councillor award funding um, category because it gave a, a degree of a, a much a greater degree of flexibility with the, the size of, of the allocation, um, etc. So, so I just wanted to maybe open this up now to. Um, councillors to see um, to see what your your views are on it, um, and 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 then we'll um, vote on it. So, Councillor Manders. Yes, thank you. Um, well, I'm in favour of pooling uh, this amount. Um, it's not very much money, um, but uh, which is why we've got to put it all together, you know, to uh, to make something a bit more substantial. Um, also, proving it means that it's guaranteed that it's spent in a year. That there's nothing sitting in a board account, as it were. Uh, waiting to be spent. So, so I would move that and I, I would hope that considering there are more important items on the agenda that we don't take too long over this chair. Thank you. Okay, uh, th thank you for that. Um, and I probably would agree. I think it's still the opportunity for each ward councillor to come forward with things that are interest in their ward to bring it forward and to bring it to the attention of um, our neighbourhood manager, James. So it's not that it does stop you doing smaller things. Um, does anyone else have any comments you would like to make at this time or are we happy to, to go with the, the pooling? Um, thank you. Um, so from the perspective of Tolworth, we feel like it would, we need that money in Tolworth if we pull it. It just feels a bit risky that we pull it together and then the funds will go elsewhere when we know that Tolworth has, has needs that could be not fulfilled or addressed, but could be minimised by using that funding. So I feel like, we feel like from the perspective of Tolworth, it would be better to keep it separate and not pull. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I'm not sure who's... I, I saw Councillor Reeve and then Councillor Green. Uh, but, yes, I, I can understand that you... You're, I, I would agree with, um, with Councillor Manders that in, in pooling the amounts of money because that gives us the ability to do uh, bigger projects, as he, as he very well said. Um, and I, th I think with regard to TOR, though, I, I can understand your concerns there, um, but I think that it is entirely possible, you know, to, to make applications from Tolworth, you know, or, you know, for Tolworth projects, and that those would all be considered, you know, you know as seriously as, in, as any other proposal um, would be. So um, with the proper case, uh, you know, brought to support it. Thank you. Um, Councillor Green. Um, I was just going to say, when we were doing it as a pooled fund, um, I don't think we actually refused any of the ones that came forward to committee. Um, it just allowed us to all have oversight and the public to have oversight. Um, and I'll give you an example of Tolworth. This is far more relevant to Tolworth than uh, it is to St Mark's and, and Seething Wells residents. Um, not that they can't get the bus over there and then embark on their walk or cycle. Um, 
But yeah, so I, and I actually think on the uh, Broadway lights, I think this committee, by pooling it, spent more on the Broadway lights than THR did with their individual ward funding, I think, because I know you got the details. Um, and I was trying to look up the email quickly, but can't. Um, so I'd be in favour of pooling it. Um, we can revisit it each year. So if it's not working for any one of the wards, then we can revisit it in a year's time. Um, and if any councillor wished to bring that back and explain why they didn't feel it was working for their ward, I'd very much be happy to listen to that. Thank, thank, thank you, Councillor Green. Councillor Manager, you want to say one something more? Um, and then I, yeah, I'll go this, to... Uh, yeah. the, the, um, well, I was going to suggest a compromise, but um, you, it may not help. Um, but, I mean, why don't the, uh, apart from Tolworth, the other wards pool their amount and then just leave Tolworth... Uh, with their amount, which is about six thousand pounds, isn't it? Three thousand pounds per councillor, and um, and move on that that basis. We're now going to. I've got Councillor Hillinger, and then I've got Councillor Green. I um, and um, so I think um, if we just do. A, I'm not wanting to spend too much longer on this. I'm probably going to, to move something quite quickly because I think we do, as you say, have other things to discuss and we can, uh, what Councillor Green says is, is true. We can um, try out for this year and see how it works and, 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 and take it from there. But um, Councillor Hurling. Um, I'm in favour of pooling it. I think it um, enables it to be targeted to where it's needed most and uh, it's more transparent. <coughs> Thank you. Um, I had um, Councillor Gr sorry, Councillor Green. Councillor Green, did you put your hand up again to say something after that? And I, then, then I, I did. I think we all have to go with one method or the other. Yeah. Yes, um, yes. I think um, having one ward out of it will make it extremely difficult. And I was just trying again, the lack of Wi-Fi and having to try and hotspots driving me nuts, because um, I was just trying to look up. But parts of Alexandra are effectively Tolworth, <laughs> to my mind, anyway. Um, and it's the same with um, all the wards. It just, I, I really, I'd rather keep it individual than um, uh, have some mishmash between the wards. We all do the same, as far as I'm concerned. Sorry, thank you for trying to compromise, Councillor Mundell. I don't think it works, though. <laughs> Councillor Wildridge. Yeah, I mean, it's about the aggregate amount of money. It's about what we do with that money. Just remind me again, what was the largest capital expense you spent last year on this Do, fund? Well, I mean, I, I think I'm probably looking to James to see if he's got a list of them all, but I think it's more to do with, um, it comes, the, the, we have the amount that we've got for each of us. We've got the £2,000, yeah, we've the question it all was together. The, James, is the aggregate amount of money that was spent on one facultative piece of funding? Please, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, the largest piece of council war funding allocated last year was, of course, the festive decorations, uh, closely followed by the hanging baskets. Um, I'm just loading up the sums now to give you and give you the exact numbers. But it was uh, festive decorations first, hanging baskets two. So, uh, and my memory is that the the lights in in Surbiton um, was about uh, roughly about thirteen thousand, was it? So, um, so that and the hanging baskets was see, another I, I, large I, one. Excuse me, and we also had quite a lot of lights in. We, we paid for some solar lights in um, Tolworth Broadway. I, I just think that should be more of a commercial aspect, um, not for residents, um, and um, the money could be wiser spent. And I leave it like that. So that, that's, I, I think we probably leave it because you weren't a councillor at that point and we looked at it in the round with the different circumstances. It was a, at the time of pandemic, was still with us, etc. So, so there was, and there was different things going on. So, so I think what, what I'm going to do is I'm sensing that we do have some differences here, but I think we have got, I'm going to sort of propose, if somebody wants to second, that we, we recommend that we, we continue with the pooling because I think I've heard most people saying that they would like to continue with the pooling and, and if we can, um, somebody wants to second that for me, uh, Councillor Euganathan, and, and then we can go to a vote on it. So, um, so can we have a show of hands? Who would like to, to go with pulling of council ward funding? Can I have a show of hands? So, t uh, ten. Not in favour? Two. Okay. So, um, I... I it's a shame that that's the way it's worked out. Um, and I think, uh, let's see how it goes. And I would say the challenge is to you. 
um, is that as ward councillors to now um, find things that you want to spend it on and, and come back to the committee as soon as possible with things in Tolworth that you want to spend the money for the uh, our council ward funding on. That's, that's my challenge that I would leave, leave with you. Um, because that's the, the difference. Is it? You, you have to make sure that you bring the things to us that you want to spend in Tolworth. Okay? Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Yes. Okay. So, so what we've got, I know that it's quite a hot evening, and we've already um, ha been going for an now just well, just short, short of an hour. Um, do we want to have a five minutes break before we have the first planning application, uh, planning consultation, or do you want to carry on? Yes. Okay. So we have a five minutes break just to um, just relax and and, and uh, have have a comfort break before we move on to the next item. Thank you.
Okay, thank you, everybody. If we can um, just get back to uh, to the meeting again, thank you very much for for um, sticking with us um, this evening. I know it's a, as a, a hot evening. We've got two um, planning consultations on the agenda. Um, these are items that we're not deciding on this evening. It's still an ongoing process. Um, it's just that there are things, there, there are bigger developments in um, our neighbourhood um, and, and we as councillors wanted to have a look at it um, and make our comments before it goes on to the planning committee and it's an opportunity for the applicant to come along and, and tell us what um, their plans are and for them to listen to um, and maybe answer some of the questions from residents um, and, and councillors at this meeting. Um, it is not to say the end of the process. You can still register your comments. They can still be registered um, through the, the planning um, site um, and, and, and any points you want to raise will still be included in there. Um, the, the, the report this evening has some that are just for um, that they have received to date, but it is an ongoing process right up until the, the day of it being taken to the planning committee. We do have, as I've already mentioned, there are three um, councillors on this meeting who are remaining, um, but they're not going to contribute. And, uh, sorry, actually, this is, there's two. Two, no, three. Three that are um, remaining but not going to contribute and, and one who has had to, to leave and has, has left, left the room because of, of, of a, a, a interest, registered interest. So what we have, I'm going to start with Redline Industrial Estate. I think most of you are here. Uh, can I have a show of hands? Who's here for Redline? Yes, so, so, so yes, it is the, the main, uh, main reason people are here. Um, well, I'd, um, the applicants are, you're sitting here, okay. I, I don't know whether you want to come forward together or individually. Um, we've got sort of 10, 15 minutes of, you know, you can present, you don't have to use all of it, um, uh, but, but you do have um, up to, to uh, 15 minutes to, to present your, your, your um, application. So. Yes, this may need to turn around. yes. And, and this isn't our normal venue, but councillors, if you want to, um, turn around to, to look at the, the, this, the screen, then, then you can. So would you like to come forward? Thank you for coming this evening and, and um, we'll start your, your presentation. Is that on? Yes, okay. Um, thank you, Chair Lady. Um, good evening, members of the committee. My name is Carmel Texter and I'm here on behalf of the applicant CB Tolworth Investment LLP who are a joint venture between Bridges Ventures and Chancery Gate Limited. Um, Bridges, Bridges Ventures are a specialist fund dedicated to sustainable investment, and Chancery Gate, who I work for, are the UK's largest multi-unit industrial developer. Um, we currently have more than 3.5 million square foot of industrial space under construction, or ready to be developed, um, and that's across 32 sites ranging from Bournemouth to Edinburgh. This planning application was validated by the Council's planning department in November 2021 and is the subject of a planning performance agreement with the Royal Borough of Kingston. Since the application has been live, we have worked closely with the Council's officers, um, we've been in discussions with the Advantage Day Nursery, and we've attended the Design Southeast Design Review Panel to evolve the plans to those which are presented to you today and have been submitted to the Council for consideration. The report in front of you provides a description of the proposed development and the site context. So I won't repeat that, um, repeat this here, except that the site is within a locally significant industrial site. Um, the proposed scheme represents the redevelopment of an underused brownfield site for a lawful employment use. And therefore, in terms of principle, the proposed development is both supported and encouraged by the adopted and emerging local plan policies and the policies of the London plan. It also accords with the economic objectives set out within the National Planning Policy Framework. Given the context of the site, the layout of the scheme has been carefully considered to sensitively address the neighbouring uses. The units mostly face inwards, resulting in the main activity of the site being shielded by the buildings themselves, whilst providing a considered relationship to Red Lion Road and adjacent occupiers. 
although the noise modelling undertaken and subsequently endorsed by the council's officers indicate it is not required, acoustic fencing has been included along the boundary with the residential property so as to further ensure amenity is protected. Unit 9, sympathetic, unit nine sorry, sympathetically addresses the boundary with the Advantage Day Nursery. It is set back over three metres from the boundary to allow for an extensive landscape buffer to be accommodated and its roof line orientated so that the lowest point of the roof at 6.5 metres runs parallel to the length of their boundary, meaning when stood in their courtyard, the ridge of the roof will not be seen. The landscape buffer also extends along the southern nursery boundary, creating a robust visual barrier and softening the views. In our discussions with the nursery, they have specifically requested a Leilandi hedge is planted the length of the southern and partway along the western boundary, which will, which will create um, a robust, consistent visual screen that they desire. In terms of integrating the proposals with the surrounding area, following discussions with the council's urban design officer and the design review panel, the north elevation of units eight and nine are facing onto Red Lion Road have been activated, making a positive contribution to the residential setting and the character of the area. An additional wide pedestrian and cycle entrance has been included here also, providing connectivity in and through the site. In addition to considering the specific boundary with a nursery, a comprehensive landscape strategy, strategy has been developed across the whole site and the proposals have sought to maximise all available areas for planting whilst ensuring the site is still able to operate as an industrial site. N native species have been included across the site, except for, as discussed above, the proposed Leylandi hedge along the nursery boundary, which has been incorporated at the, on the explicit request of the nursery. Careful consideration has also been given to the design of three amenity or breakout areas across the site. These will be designed with seating areas and a range of planting, creating a desirable place for employees and or estate occupiers to enjoy during their breaks. Overall design and layout and appearance of the proposed development is of a high quality, representing a significant betterment over the existing unattractive, unlawful use, which compri comprises of ad hoc temporary buildings, no landscaping and operations of which are not subject to any controls. The proposed development will be highly sustainable, meeting BRIAM excellent ratings, achieving net zero carbon for regulated energy. It incorporates 20% active electric parking spaces and 80% passive spaces, um, and also achieving a quantifiable net gain for biodiversity in relation to habitats and hedgerows. In terms of highways, the proposed development will make use of the existing estate road entrance. Um, the development proposes 49 parking spaces and long and short term cycle spaces. The amount of vehicular parking proposed is in accordance with the London plan standards and has been agreed with both council highways officers and TfL. The submitted transport statement sets out that the proposed development comparatively to the existing use on site will only generate an additional 16 a.m. peak two-way vehicle trips and an additional 3 p.m. peak two-way vehicle trips. The Council's Highways officers requested that further sensitivity testing was undertaken by us to ensure that all the modelling that we had carried out to date was robust. This additional modelling has been undertaken and the results of which confirm that the acceptability of the proposals as previously set out in our um, original transport statement are still relevant and um, our transport addendum is currently with your highways officers for review. As of this morning, we haven't had those comments back as yet. Uh, the types of uses the development is likely to attract are similar to those already operating on the wider estate, with minimal nighttime movements, unlike the larger logistic single box users that you see around. That being said, as a part of the application, a delivery noise management plan and a delivery service management plan have been prepared to ensure that best practice is adhered to during all delivery operations, both night and day. We would expect a condition to be open, to be put on any um, decision given requiring adherence to those documents at all times. Our scheme will deliver a number of significant economic and social benefits in accordance with the Council's aspirations for the site as a local significant industrial site. The proposed development comprises the redevelopment of an underused site, making efficient use of previously developed land to provide new buildings for flexible employment uses, supporting local business growth, creating new jobs within the borough and providing a st um, stimulus in expenditure with the local economy through both the construction and oper 
occupation phases of development. Social environmental benefits would also arise from the high quality design, layout and landscape of the proposed development. And additional environmental benefits would be realized through the numerous sustainable measures that would be integrated into the design of the proposed development, including electrical charging, parking spaces, solar PV, and achieving net zero carbon. Having regard to the identified benefits and considering all relevant matters, the proposed development is considered to be fully compliant with all relevant planning policy and should therefore be supported. However, we would welcome any comments or questions. Thank you, um, Carmel. Um, are, are you the you're, you're the only one that's speaking this evening? Yes, you're. you're. Answer. That's absolutely fine. So thank thank you very very much for that introduction. Um, I've got some um, people who've um, registered to to speak on this. Um, I've got um, the first one I've got is um, um, Hazel Moody. Is she here? Hazel. Hello. Th th thank you for coming this evening. And, and do you want to um, ask your, your question? Is it a question of the applicant or um, make your no, comment? It's a presentation. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. OK. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and members of the council. Um, I'm Hazel Moody. I'm the director and manager of Vantage Day Nursery, and I have been since it started in 2003. Um, situated in Red Line Road, Surbiton, at the front of the business park. Advantage Day Nursery is a 270 place Ofsted regulated setting which has been accredited as outstanding very recently in a time when many provisions are being downgraded. Ofsted awarded us outstanding in part because we provide the right environment where safeguarding is at the heart of everything we do. The nursery is an important community asset caring for nearly 500 children each week and with a staff team of over 90 who are recruited locally and trained up to degree level. Achieving for Children, AFC, also regularly use our facilities to house their meetings and training courses due to a lack of their own facilities. Our fundamental concern is to preserve the children's environment from day one of construction, as safeguarding cannot wait five years for trees to mature. In our initial objection and in two subsequent meetings and correspondence with developers, we have explained our concerns and proposed me suitable measures and amendments to work with them. The revised submitted plans do not address our concerns or take on board our suggestions at all. To explain, other developers might warrant a focus on end results and the use of various offsets to achieve the right environmental profile but this is not the right approach for this development. It is clear that pollution, both noise and airborne particles, need to be at levels appropriate for all our children, including two-month-old babies sleeping in the outside env environment, getting fresh air just two to three metres away from the proposed queuing of waiting HGVs with their stopping, starting, revving, reverses no reversing noises, reaching high decibels, and the pollution from their engines. Many of our children suffer from asthma, some with serious implications to their health, and one child who has a tracheotomy, all needing an, um, an environment where they can breathe in clean air and should be able to be expect, uh, they should be able to expect to do so. All children access the outside environment, and it is an extent, essential extension of our classrooms where children do much of their learning. Sharing this outdoor space are children who have a hearing impairment and many who have been diagnosed with ASD, autism. <clears throat> High levels or constant sounds can contribute or trigger a sensory overload where they become very distressed. It will take staff over an hour to comfort and calm them. It is therefore imperative that all our children have an environment that is safe and appropriate where they are able to thrive and develop. Advantage Day Nursery will not accept the downgrading of the environment that children in our care are used to and should expect. As a director running Advantage Day Nursery, I have a duty of care to not only the children in my care, but also the staff who work with me to ensure the well-being and safeguarding of everyone who steps into the nursery. 
Not only is it my duty, it is a legal requirement which is regulated. Non-compliance for this area could result in a withdrawal of our registration to operate. We have suggested that a meaningful green border between the industrial site and the nursery is established or maintained following a tree survey, which would be a partial solution in preserving the children's environment. We believe it is recognised that current plans for the building and construction process will have a significant and negative impact on the children's health and ultimately our business. Already I've had several parents who live very locally to us threatening to remove their children should the development become a risk to their children's health. Finally, I request that the planning and environmental officers and all you um, councillors from Kingston Council to please visit Advantage Day Nursery, our unique and remarkable setting, and take into consideration our concerns. I would urge them to stop a minute and think whether they would like their children or grandchildren subjected to the potential pollution the proposal, as it is, will most certainly bring, and to stop and consider all I have said before allowing this proposal, as it is, on the site just two to three metres away from our 500 children. All children should be able to breathe clean air and not be subjected to constant loud noises. We will not accept anything less for them, as our core value at Advantage Day Nursery is <coughs> children come first, and that will always be our motto. Thank you for listening. Thank you for that. Um, would you like to respond to any of that? Is there the, no, you, okay. I'll leave it out. That as a no. Okay, um, uh, that's fine. I've, next person on, on the list uh, is uh, Shamintha Jiatilalaka. Sorry, I'm really, apologies for my pronunciation. Thank you. Uh, no problem at all. Uh, it's a very, very long Sri Lankan name. Um, Thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak. Uh, I live on the Fuller's Way North, right opposite the number seven, actually, so very close by, uh, to a new development that's suggested. Uh, my daughter attends Advantage Day Nursery. Uh, I just came from there. Um, so for me, this development, um, when it was originally proposed, uh, I thought it will bring more business to the area, so I thought it wasn't straight away opposed to it. Uh, but um, as I read into it, I realized uh, we're talking here about heavy traffic um, caused by HGVs. Um, as a resident of Fuller's Way North, I can tell you that um, every time a truck passes there, the house actually shakes. That affects my other neighbors who are here as well in the same way, creates cracks in the house. Um, our gardens are um, at the moment quite, quite quiet because it's a car dealership, I think, in the back, and they're relatively quiet, so we don't have any kind of noise pollution or anything created at the moment, nor is there any um, uh, crime or any kind of uh, misuse. Our concern is by, by changing this, um, we will have lots of HGV drivers who are sitting very high on trucks who will be able to look into our gardens and, in, and interfere into our privacy. Um, it will also create noise from the front as well as from the back. So it's kind of, we are sandwiched in between noise levels. Um, the reports also suggest that traffic will be highest during peak hours, which is exactly the time when there are actually three schools on this road, Fuller's Way North and Red Line Road. So there's Advantage Day Nursery, Tolworth Girls Schools, and another school further up. Um, that's when the parents are dropping off the children or picking up time, so it's gonna actually, um, I know we had this presentation earlier about you trying to reduce traffic, but it's gonna actually, it's pointless, your, your project, um, when, if this goes ahead. Um, and I think uh, that, that, that's my, my <coughs> biggest concerns. There were some other things that, that, was, that, was, that were mentioned about um, you know, having a lot of truck drivers, kind of issues and problems that come along with that when you have a large congregation of that. I won't go into that, but these are points that, that will also sit in my mind. Um, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Okay. 
Um, would you like to respond to some of that? Thank, thank you, Carmel. Um, I just would like to respond on the matter of um, HGV movements to and from the site. Um, the site, the units that we're proposing are relatively small in size. Um, they are similar to the units that are in the rest of the state. Um, and whilst we can't categorically say that HGVs will not be entering the site, um, and we have to design accordingly, looking at tracking, etc., cetera, um, vehicular tracking in and out of the site, our, as I said in the beginning of our presentation, we do this up and down the country all the time, and units of this size generally don't attract very many HGV movements. It tends to be smaller sprinter vans, um, and the type of occupiers in this don't generally have very many um, deliveries going to and from the site. So the figures that I gave are looking not only at the larger vehicles, but also at people attending the site who work there in their cars, etc. Um, the transport statement itself does break down those vehicle movements um, into more detail. Um, that's available, obviously, on the council's website. Um, but you're looking, during that peak time, for it to be more like four um, OGV trips, so the, the smaller vehicles. Um, HGVs also tend to try and stay off the main network during really busy peak times because it slows them down, they want to get from A to B as quickly as possible, and that doesn't happen during peak travel periods anywhere. Um, so whilst our reports have to plan for worst cases, um, the reality of what actually happens on the site is often not the same. I'm not saying it's not going to change the, um, the, the area. Um, it is its development, um, but it is unlikely to be as bad as potentially thought. Thank you for that update. Um, I've got uh, Rajesh um, Sahar Devan. Thank you. Do you want to come and make your comments. Um, I know that it is, it is moving on and, and I, I know that it, you've got, there are a lot of people who want to speak, but um, we have had, um, if we can keep it as brief as possible and not d duplicating points that have already yeah. been made. Thank you. Good evening all. Um, my name is Rajesh. I live in Fullersway North and my uh, back garden is shared with uh, this development. I'm worried about uh, uh, so much traffic, especially heavy vehicles and 24-7 uh, operation. Um, I had a two road accidents on this road because of the heavy traffic, um, as well as this development will have a, a lot of flood lights, and those lights are going to make impact on residents and who is sharing the boundary. Um, and uh, the operation 24-7, it make a lot of noise that's going to make impact on the people sleep and uh, other things. And I'm, I'm living with a rare health condition called a polycythemia, so it's going to affect my life. And it's going to put in risk. Yeah. Thank you very much for making those comments. Okay. Thank you for coming. Right, um, next person on my list is, oh, oh. That I should have. Sorry, I should, I should have looked at, um, to see if you wanted to. Thanks. Hi, hi. I'm Matt. I'm a project manager at Chancery Gate. Just on the external lighting, there's an external lighting assessment submitted with the uh, planning application, which is on, on the website, and it sort of details the lux levels, etc., all along the boundaries, which will uh, sort of win the acceptable uh, limits. So that you can have a look at that. Thank, thank, thank you for that bit of information. Okay, thank you. And, and, and uh, we're, we're just, uh, so you, you know that we're just looking at the consultation item. We're not looking at all of the documents, uh, which are all, all, all of these documents are on, on the website, on the planning portal, if, you, if any of the residents want to, to look at it. But thank you for that update. Um, Sarah Field. Have we, you were, okay. Um, so if you can, um, I, I'm just conscious of time um, because I've got, uh, so are you, is, uh, Emma as well? Right, so there's, okay, so there's the Sarah, Emma, and, and Liz, yeah? yeah. Um, okay, so, so if we can, um, if possible, not repeat points yeah. we've made already, yeah. I know, and, okay. and be brief. It's just because um, it's, 
I, I know it's, it's really important to you. And, 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 and the key thing about this meeting is that you have more time to speak. If this is a planning committee, you would only have a set amount of time. So, so whilst it might feel that I'm rushing you, it, it's a lot more time than you would get if you went to the planning committee. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, thank you to the chair and to the committee for, uh, for considering our, uh, our comments. Uh, my name's Emma Parker. I, um, I actually live at One Fuller's Way North, uh, which is, is uh, bordering directly onto where the proposed Unit 8 would be. Um, uh, Liz, Sarah and I will be structuring our presentation around specific things, and uh, we're representing uh, the surrounding roads within our properties. Um, so loss of light. Uh, page seven of the covering letter refers to the daylight and sunlight assessment and states that it meets the BRE guide default target criteria. It acknowledges concerns raised by Vantage and local residents regarding loss of light and therefore amendments have been made, including that there are no adverse effects from the proposal to the neighboring Vantage Day Nursery. Much emphasis has been placed on the impact to Vantage, which is operational during daytime and borders unit nine. But what's the impact to residents bordering other units? Therefore, daylight and sunlight concerns for residents are still valid and have not been addressed. The BRE guide may be the industry source reference for daylight and sunlight review, but it's not a set of prescriptive planning rules and is conceived as an aid to planners. The developer should consider whether there is material deterioration harm and whether this would be acceptable in the wider context of the application process. Table A of the daylight and sunlight report shows that all houses backing onto the development will have a reduction in sunlight and an increase in shade with some houses losing 10% or more sunlight whilst gaining over 10% more shade. The adverse effects due to the loss of light will constitute a material deterioration and is therefore not acceptable. Uh, overlooking loss of privacy. Uh, significant concerns regarding this have been raised by Vantage and local residents. Therefore, we offer the following considerations. Have issues raised by Vantage, such as safeguarding, been considered and addressed? How is safeguarding of children and adults going to be managed during the construction phase of the project? Uh, the drawings show buildings of between 7 and 10 metre elevation with houses backing onto the border. How is this privacy going to be protected? The size and proximity of the buildings, which includes overlooking windows, allows for loss of privacy to direct residents, even if the windows are highly situated. This potentially poses safeguarding issues, especially for residents and the nursery. The consultation flyer, which was posted to neighbours, claimed that the buildings would be set back from the adjacent residential, residential properties, nursery and school, and will not impact on the privacy. However, residents in the nursery have complained explicitly about this. The proximity to the nursery has been addressed, but not concerns raised by local residents. Uh, noise and disturbance. The noise impact assessment says that the nearest sensitive residential receptors are on Red Line Road, Fuller's Way North and Tolworth Road to the north and west at approximately 20 to 30 metres from the site's northern and western boundaries. This is factually incorrect, as the site shares a direct boundary with residential properties on these roads. Planning statements 7.51, 7.52 and the noise assessment state that the predicted noise levels from vehicle operations are lower than existing ambient noise levels and therefore no adverse impacts are predicted at existing sensitive receptors, the adjacent nursery or toll of girls' school, and that there is predicted to be an overall decrease in total vehicle trips and annual emissions from the development compared to existing operations with noise levels lower than existing ambient noise levels. But how can this be with increased HGV, uh, LGV deliveries? We're curious how the addition of potential, potential hundreds of HGV and other vehicles accessing the site 24-7 will not have an adverse impact. Currently, there is little HGV and LGV delivery on site, with no HGV and LGVs currently accessing where units 6 and 7 and 8 and 9 are planned. Statement 7.55 states, overall no adverse noise effects are predicted as a result of the construction or operation of the development, either during the daytime or nighttime periods. Does this mean that the construction of a major development will cause no adverse noise at all? The World Health Organization Night Noise Guidelines for Europe advise that for a good night's sleep, noise levels within bedrooms should not exceed 30 decibels. Table 5.2 shows that the predicted levels of noise from three Willis, Fuller's Way North exceed these recommendations, but you predict that noise will decrease with no adverse impact on residents. What about the other residents, considering the expected increase in HGVs and the operating hours of the site? We're curious how you think that this will not have an adverse impact. 
Uh, loss of trees and greenery. Although slight changes have been made to incorporate more greenery, the whole development does not feel aligned towards posit positive environmental change. The review by Design Southeast asked for further consideration for green roofs and walls. However, the developers have refused this as they claim they are too expensive and difficult to maintain. Why is the council even considering a proposal that is not aligned to their own environmental policies and Kingston's own climate action plan? Thank you. In terms of parking, loading and turning issues, the car park management plan says at 2.4.1, the day-to-day -day management of the development will be the responsibility of the management company who have the responsibility for ongoing review and monitoring. However, this is all done at the discretion of the management company, 0.4.1.4. There is no enforcement, no incentive. The delivery noise management sets out guidance. There is no enforcement or no incentive. Here are some examples of the guidance, page 10. Using newer and quieter delivery vehicles and equipment where practicable. Page 11. If opening a gate, sell a flat roller door, shutter door, to gain access, do so gently and as little as possible. Page 12, lower the flaps on the tail lifts carefully and quietly. The strategy for implementing these guidelines frequently states, and I quote, signs at the entry of the site warning of the residential surrounding buildings. The DSMP shows the turning circle for large vehicles accessing and egressing the industrial site. For the residents living directly opposite the entrance to the industrial site, this will be incredibly disturbing at all times of the day and night. And at night, with the sound of vehicles braking and turning and headlights shining directly into their rooms after dark. So there will be noise and lights at, par at parking, loading and turning, and the management company can address these issues at their discretion. So the development application has no adverse impact Oh, but you put up a sign. There are no maximum number of deliveries set. So let's take a scenario. One delivery to each planned HGV parking loading space per half an hour would be 480 HGVs or 960, if they do it in 15 minutes, visiting the site every day. The DSMP says it is up to the site management to manage those delivery slots so that the vehicles do not back up. And where are they going to back up? Fuller's Way North, Red Line Road. That statement shows how busy they expect the site to be. How can they conclude that, quote, there will be no adverse effect on traffic with a potential of between 480 and 960 LGV visits to the site per day? This certainly doesn't sound like no adverse impact on to the increase in traffic. The planning application seeks a 247365 unrestricted use to allow for deliveries for nine commercial units within in total 10 LGV, HGV sorry, loading bays. According to the Delivery Service Management Plan, this development will put HGVs onto residential roads at any time of the day and night. If we just look at the HGVs again, currently one tenant only on the current site has deliveries using an HGV. And they average eight to 12 deliveries per month. Eight to 12, sorry, six to eight. The rest are via tabletop trucks with the capacity for one vehicle. Visitors to the site are infrequent and kept to business hours only. So if we look at the development application, 10 HGVs, potential of 480 to 960 HGVs a day, it includes, excludes LGVs and other vehicles, how can they say there will be no adverse impact? The transport addendum, table 2.1 and 3.2, says only peak times are referred to in all the documentation, and within that, only two hours a day. And you've heard that HGVs avoid that two hours a day. There's no reference to out-of-business hours traffic impact, school run times, nor at any other times of the day. Where is that data? Traffic data taken by council is available and it shows that, tra that traffic is busy inside the area outside of those mere two hours a day. There is no plan changes to existing road infrastructure. The existing road infrastructure is at maximum capacity, we all know that, and it would only put additional traffic onto local roads. Savile's covering letter concludes, based on the addendum to the transport <coughs> statement, 
there will be no adverse traffic impacts are expected as a result of the development proposal implementation. How can this be the case? The Urban Design Officer states that consideration should be given to signage along Red Lion Road to create identity for the site and to age legibility and wayfinding. So according to the DSMP, specifically points 2.2.2 and 3.4, it includes details of how larger vehicles are not permitted to turn off the A3 onto Fuller's Way North outside of business hours. So at other times they will be accessing the site from Yule Road via <coughs> Red Lion Road. Liz. But you want to put up a sign. Liz, can I ask you to how much more? Because it's quite a lot, and yep. I do, I'm very conscious that there are other people who'd want to speak. Yep. And I, I think um, I would urge you to put that on to the, the portal. If those are all the comments that you've made, yeah, I then think I think they're very Emma detailed. Is, yeah. So I think we're probably going to have to say that you've, you, you've had yeah, over, over 15 minutes, which is actually more than the applicant took. So. Um, but we I are representing several roads. I, yeah. I know, but it's, yeah. it, I'm just thinking that there are other people who would like to speak. So can, 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 I can I you have one, one quick point seconds, and then, yeah. then we'll I leave it I just want to raise the lack of any meaningful consultation for residents. So they put fly, the, the developers put flyers through residents' doors and Advantage Nursery and Tolworth Girls. Um, but it was distributed in the summer when people were on holiday. It looked like a glossy flyer. You could only um, specifically answer the questions on there. Um, it also totally failed to mention that they wanted unrestricted use of the site. I feel like they've done li very little to engage with the local community. There's been no effort to engage with any hard-to-reach groups. Um, and I really think a full and meaningful consultation sh should have taken place before we got to here today. Thank you. Thank, thank you, and, and, and we, well, well, the councillors are all listening just now, um, and so thank you very much. Right, um, thank, thank you. I've got um, Kim Bergman. Again, I, I would, no, I know, I'd, pick. okay, pick well, I'm just pick. going to say, if, it, if it's repeating of points, I mean, I, I know that it, you've spent a lot of time, and I can say, no, 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 I haven't got a whole, put a lot of research spiel. into it, but if it can be recorded no, no. for the, the planning officers, we're, we're just councillors <laughs> here today, um, so thank, thank you very much. So, some of, a couple of these are things that I want the council to take back, because we have concerns all about the process elsewhere. So, I live directly opposite number eight. Okay, so this is my husband's questions on this because he's at home with kids. Um, we received, we put in an objection to the planning and he received a reply from the council officer and he summarised his objections as car park issues, inadequate landscaping, inappropriate design layout, noise and privacy. And that's fine as far as it goes, but he missed two of the most important things, the objection to the 24-hour licence and then misleading documents in the planning application. What a council is going to do to avoid being asked to make a decision based on information selected in an inadequate way by a council officer that responded to us? We, we don't. It's a generic question, and I'm yeah. chair of the planning committee. Yeah. So what is happening is all members of the planning committee, it is summarised in the report, but as members we get anonymised the full thing. So right. whatever you put in the email, and this is for all planning, so it's yep. not just Good. to yours, we get an emailed copy with all your personal details taken out. Okay, but okay. you get every word that we've we, written. We get every word that you have written. Okay. It amounts to a lot sometimes. Okay. <laughs> and one of the concerns we have with the noise at night with this 24-7 licence is the expectation that we're opposite two units that have outdoor seating areas directly opposite my kids' bedrooms, my bedroom, there's going to be people sitting out there at 2 a.m. having their dinner or their lunch. And particularly along Emma's border. Yeah, you'll be waving at them. How is that suitable to residents? And the office windows across the front, are, if it's 24-7, you are going to have staff members in those offices overlooking the houses opposite 
straight into their bedrooms. Thanks. Thank, thank That's you. It. I've, thank That's you. I've taken that. So that's all the the, the red. Uh, do you want to come back? Yes, come back. Um, there was a lot, and um, I, I can't respond to them all now. Um, there's just a couple of points I just wanted to clarify, just for fact. Um, but the obviously everything goes out to all the council's um, offices for them to review, and that is, you know, a set process. And their 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 job is there to um, independently review everything and come back. So um, I'll allow them to do that themselves. But just in terms of a couple of things, there was mentioned about um, nighttime construction, um, the construction management plan doesn't allow for nighttime construction um, and the council would never allow that anyway so that's not going to happen um, in terms of um, deliveries coming at any time of the day there is already HGV and, in the, and that point was made in particular into HGVs there's already HGV restrictions up and down Red Lion Road um, I can tell you exactly what the sign says but it restricts them um, between midnight and 7 um, and 9 p.m. and midnight so basically it's only during the daytime hours and Saturdays the same and no no deliveries on Sundays for HDVs so that is already restricted um, in terms of the outdoor amenity area um, facing Red Line Road on units 8 and 9 and the, that active frontage actually the original application that we submitted didn't have any of that and that has been on the request of the council's urban design officer and the design review panel we would be quite happy to revert back to what we originally submitted. Um, but there's obviously a balance, and we are trying to find that balance as much as everyone else. Um, and just in terms of consultation, um, we, did do, we did do a flyering. It wasn't during the summer holidays. It was after. Um, and um, the questions were specific, but the last question was, if you've got any other feedback, please let us know. And we only received a handful of feedbacks. Um, uh, we would have quite happily had the discussions with everyone. Thank you very much for, for that. Right, so, so we've had, um, heard from um, the applicant and uh, um, we've heard from residents. I was now going to open it up to um, councillors if you had any questions. So not comments, but questions for the um, applicant. Okay, so I've got Councillor Shaper, um, Councillor... Okay. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I've just got um, three questions, really. Um, so I appreciate the developments within this existing footprint. Obviously, we, 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 it's very clear where it's situated within a residential area. But I'd like to, I'm, I'm really interested when I look at the plans to see what your rationale was situating the, the access road where it is, because obviously, if you look at the plan, it's quite a sizable amount of that road space is near residential area rather than to the south of the bottom of the screen. So I'm just interested to know what your rationale was, was not, you mentioned an existing access route rather than perhaps looking at um, a, a potentially less disruptive um, uh, area where cars could potentially be loading and unloading. So that was my first question. Um, my second question is, I'm really interested to know, I know this is probably maybe not strictly to do with the plan itself, but I am interested in what you mentioned about anticipating what type of businesses are already there, but I'm, I'm interested in what you think you would want to attract and why. So obviously from this development, uh, what are your aspirations for what type of businesses you think are going to be attracted to that kind of design? Mm -hmm. And thirdly, what's the proposed business model, if I may ask? Is this rentable units? So, you know, do you have, is it about long-term rental? Clearly you want to attract businesses that want to stay with you. So I'd like to get a bit more of a feel for that because I think that's a really um, important part of, I think, about how this design is setting itself out. Um, to attract potential business and um, at the moment um, I have got some concerns about where you've positioned in particular the, ac the access route and where the cars are parked, thank you and I I'll come to comments later Chair if that's alright yeah. 
Yeah, thanks. Yes, yeah, if just the questions, would you like to yeah. answer? Can them? I just um, just clarify your point on the access? Do you mean the access that runs alongside um, the Advantage Day Nursery through the site? Where yes, it is? the yeah. main, I, I'm assuming that the is the only road. access yeah, route in is. and out. Yeah, thanks. Um, so it is where the existing access is. We are widening it to obviously accommodate um, slightly larger vehicles. Um, but it comes down to... Um, it comes down to a, a balance. So um, if we looked at several designs, if you flip the units around, so you have units one, two, three, four, um, say backing onto the Advantage Day Nursery, then they're impacted by, um, by um, the buildings being so close. Um, and uh, likewise with units seven and six, if you flip those units so they're sitting adjacent to the residential properties, they are then um, over, overbearing and more, um, more so than potentially what they are now. So it was about a balance between what the impacts, um, and the site is really constrained in its shape. Um, so there are, is limits um, to what you can do in order to make the site work. Am I allowed to come back with a quick supplementary just on what the ladies just said? Yeah. Um, it might f feature then in the comments at the end then. That's fine. Thank you. Um, just in terms of types of businesses, um, so when we sent out the flyers to um, all um, neighbouring properties, that included the businesses were behind, and we had a number of those businesses um, approach us, um, advising that they're ready to expand and grow, and they are looking for new premises. Some of the buildings behind there are, are very, very dated, and so they are looking for new premises, so some of those businesses potentially could relocate. Um, our units are small, so they are more inclined to um, SMEs, so small to medium enterprises, and we do tend to get more local businesses. So the site opposite the Chancery Gate um, Business Centre, that was our development a number of years ago, so it'd be similar types of occupiers that have come in there, so small manufacturing since the pandemic, there's lots of businesses that have grown in their garage and are looking for bigger space, so a bit of storage, a tiny bit of pr producing their 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 wares, if you like, um, and then distributing out from there. So they're the type of businesses we would expect in this location. Um, answering your question on the proposed business model. So, yeah, the business model is um, it's going to be leased out to individual occupiers. Um, we're quite strict on who comes into the estate. There's quite high rental levels. Um, so, they, yeah, they're going to be um, really strong businesses, small to medium-sized enterprises, maybe some national companies, that kind of thing. So it's long-term leasing is, is the business model. Thank, thank, thank you. Um, Councillor um, and, and On the papers, it indicates that the 24-hour use is sought. Why, why, you, why do you want 24 hours? Um, so the 24-hour use, um, so as we kind of um, touched on earlier, the types of occupiers that you get, whilst we are requiring a 24-hour um, uh, use, they it's not a massive logistics operation. You don't get lots of toing and froing. It tends to be the, you know, the owner of your business is, is in there doing their paperwork until midnight. I'm not saying there won't be deliveries at all, there won't be a bit of manufacturing that happens, but that will all happen internal within the buildings, which are um, noise insulated um, and forms part of our, our noise report that goes in. Um, but in order to make the, um, the site attractive to, to, to local businesses, um, we, we, we just want the 24 hours. The rest of the estate also operates under a 24 hour operation. Um, so to, to attract people, we would want that. that wasn't brilliant, but sorry. Okay, th thank you. Um, is, is that question, no. Andrew? Okay, thank you. Hi, yeah, hello. Um, it's just a little vague with regard to the sort of the businesses you want. I mean, Bridger Ventures is a easy to make tax planning. We, I know what that sort of business does. You must have a fairly rigid business plan on what you want with regard to the, the number, the type of businesses, and also the number, the, 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 the travel of, of lorries, HGVs. It just seems a little vague. With this, uh, with this kind of venture, you would have pinned it down. I would have thought. It's been speculatively, speculatively built. There, there, is, there is no end user at this point in time. So it's all about the flexibility at the moment. 
So, yeah, that, that, that's the main reason. So all the figures that we present in all the reports are based on, so in terms of um, transport, there is the National Tricks um, database, um, and that looks at... Um, so, I've, I'm sorry if I'm telling you stuff that you already know, but uh, you know, obviously it looks at um, other um, comparable sites in size and uses, and will um, and then predict a number of trip rates. We are also fortunate that we do these these developments up and down the country, so we also then compare that data against um, what we know as no movements from other sites, and that's all presented in that in that. Uh, and that's why I'm surprised you're just a little bit vague because this is what you do. Yeah, so it is all available in that transport assessment. I am not a transport planner, so I'm not going to pretend to um, try and fudge my way out of it. But it is all it is all in there, and it has been assessed by your by your by the highways officer. He has asked us because he knows it's going to be a sensitive matter to go away, relook at it, rerun the sensitivity models, considering other um, other sites that he thinks are comparable, etc. And we have presented that information back, and we're waiting on his his review. Thank you. For that, um, Councillor Manders, did you want a question? Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, I've got three questions. Um, one: Would you consider an upgrade to your green barriers? Um, I mean, I don't think Leylandia is particularly um, eco um, uh, uh, diversity uh, uh, species diversity friendly. Um, also, um, would you give an undertaking? Uh, about the size of vehicles which matches the restrictions on the local roads. If you've got those restrictions anyway, then I would have thought that it may be worth your while making a, a commitment uh, you know, to that size of vehicle. Um, and the third one is that um, to uh, cut down on random access to the uh, site at night, um, have you considered having secure access to the site limited by key card holders? Um, so, in response to your question on the Lee Landai, um, as we set out, that wasn't our first choice. Um, we um, we would always include native species, um, and that's what that's what we proposed in, in the first instance. That was requested of us by um, the Advantage State Nursery, um, and we are happy to accommodate that because it does do exactly what the Advantage Day Nursery will do, request want it to do, which is create a substantial barrier. We appreciate it. It doesn't have any biodiversity or ecological um, benefits. Um, and whilst we've said we're happy to accommodate that, it is actually with the council's ecological officer, ecology officer, biodiversity officer, to review um, and comment on. So whether or not the actual officers are happy to accept that is something that we're unsure of as yet, but we're happy to, 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 to do it. Um, the rest of the site, we are using completely native species all across the rest of the site. It's only the, that, that one boundary and a half that it hasn't got native species in it. Um, in terms of undertaking to match the restrictions, what, sorry, I'm a bit confused as to what you're kind of actually asking us to do. Um, well, as it were, you, and I thought I heard you correctly, um, you said, as it were, uh, against the idea that going to, it's going, the site's going to be used by a lot of HGVs and so on. You said there were restrictions on sizes of vehicles in the access roads. Yes. Uh, and so therefore what I've suggested, or put to you as a question, is that why don't you make a commitment to vehicle sizes which matches those restrictions on the local roads? So saying that no vehicle sizes above that size won't, will you access the site at all? That, um, well, yes, for example, if you're restricted, if you're giving that as an argument that there, there will be less size of vehicles than people think, mm -hmm. then um, why don't you make an undertaking then for that actual site that you will keep to vehicles of that size? Obviously, beyond the construction stage, but uh, yeah. um, continuing. I can't sit here and give you that promise. It's not my Would you take it back? Choice? Then, I, will, to, I will more than happily take it back for consideration, absolutely. Um, it is something actually that has... Um, that was put to us by um, the design review panel, and I believe we do address it in our resubmission to, to the council. Um, but on the basis of being asked of us again, we'll definitely go away and, and look into it. Okay, and my third question? Secure access. Um, so the pedestrian access off Red Lion Road um, by units eight and night will be done by secure access. It will be done by um, a key card or tappy thing. 
um, in terms of the a gate at the main access entrance, um, that has also been looked at, but it's not possible, is it? It's something we can look at again. You know, the rest of the estate's open. Um, but yeah, we can certainly look at putting a gate on the front if that's a, a big concern. It, we have put gates on the fronts of other sites, but I think it was probably felt that because the rest of the industrial estate was open that it was probably not necessary. But we can have a look into it. There was also a request of us to make a pedestrian route that went all the way through the front of the site, connecting down to the, to the school. Um, but we've resisted that because we a, don't feel like it's safe. I'd, I personally wouldn't send my children walking through an industrial estate to shortcut the main roads. Um, and it also poses an, uh, an insecurity issue for us. We'll look into it. Um, I just have one question. <laughs> Um, um, and it was to do, but I've heard a few times about the sort of lack of, or a perceived lack of communication with the local residents. I just wondered if you could give um, some, um, a little bit more, sorry, it's, it's something that we're quite, we do actually think as a, as a council group, you know, we've, mm -hmm. it's something that comes up quite a bit, is residents will come and tell us that the, the, the uh, applicant has not done um, particularly good communication. So if, if you could give, elaborate on what you did do, and then I'd follow the one with um, we, we, it started with the um, with the, the the manager and director of Advantage. I think that you know there again. I think the communication there. I've just if you can give a little bit of a, a yep, synopsis on that situation too. So um, before we submitted any planning application or developed the plans beyond the initial concepts, um, we had a pre-application meeting with with Kingston Council. And at that point, um, we asked them, uh, knowing the area, um, the residents, the political. Um, kind of format and lay of the land, what consultation is required in, in that area. Um, they advised us to do a, um, a leaflet drop, so that is what we did. Um, we didn't do a formal public consultation. We tend to not do them for industrial sites, particularly if they're in an industrial area because the principle is, is agreed. But we did ask for residents in, on that leaflet to come forward and speak to us. Um, and I said, as I said, we only had a handful of responses, a couple supportive, a couple saying they had concerns over highways. The Advantage Day Nursery in particular um, made comments to the planning application um, and asked to meet with us, and so we did, and we would have met with any residents had, th had that request been made of us. Um, we didn't engage with the Advantage Day Nursery prior to the application going in. Again, we had discussions with the council, um, and they didn't... Um, not think it's not important, but like didn't su suggest it as a way forward. Sorry. To call. <coughs> um, but we have had uh, several meetings with Advantage Day Nursery, um, and whilst I appreciate their views and I understand exactly where um, Hazel, the manager, is coming from, um, we have moved some way from where we were when we first submitted the planning application to try and alleviate and mitigate some of their concerns. Um, and um, and that's what we've presented to here today. <coughs> um, so my follow-up would then be, um, just a small, small one, is uh, what would you normally do elsewhere? What kind of communication would you do with residents? If it, well, I'm a, you've said that if it was an industrial estate, I can fully understand yeah. that, but it is quite a large um, industrial uh, uh, um, Residential area. area. Right. Yeah. So, um, as a rule of thumb, we do exactly what we did here. So, we do a flyer and we offer opportunities for them to um, contact us to have those discussions. If we get, and we will also um, email out to ward members, which we did do here as well. Um, and we sent the flyer um, and um, and um, asking if they would like a meeting to be held. Um, what's happened in other local authorities, if members have asked us, we have then held a, a bit more of a public meeting, much like this, but not as formal, um, where we would take questions and have those conversations. I, I can, can't speak for um, all of us, but I didn't, didn't get anything, and my ward is very close to Red Lion Estate. I will need, I'll need to check exactly who we sent the email to, but and I could do that. Right. Um, Okay, so, so we've, um, that's, I think that's, um, if we finish with the questions, if um, our councillors have any comments, I am very conscious of um, time, and I don't, and I don't want to um, preclude um, anybody saying anything, but I, I am conscious that there is another, um, another consultation. So if we could keep it brief, if we've got any comments. So I'm looking around, does anybody want to make any comment? 
Councillor Schaefer, did you, did you put, yeah, Councillor Reeve. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a, a quick comment, really, just to say um, that um, it was interesting that you mentioned um, uh, that you think this is an industrial area rather than a residential area. I probably would disagree with you on that, but that's just my own personal view. Um, I think it sits within a rather densely populated area, so I think that's a there's a big key difference there, and I think that might actually... Um, you know, uh, look to maybe some of your landscaping. It, it appears to me that um, it looks a little bit sparse in places. I know it looks like you've made an effort around the around the areas near the um, Fuller's Way North, but just overall, it just looks like there's um, a little bit lacking in landscaping overall. Um, but that's perhaps just my own personal view. Um, and um, it was interesting. I just wanted to make a final comment that I know there's you can't offer that guarantee about the sizes of vehicles, but obviously I, I, if I was a resident in that area, I would be very concerned about the size of vehicles and how much noise they make, um, because possibly there might be other traffic mitigations in and around the area. We've had a discussion tonight, obviously, about the LTN and other things, but there obviously, um, you know, there might be, we just don't know further down the line whether there be any um, other traffic issues and so I, I'm rather concerned about the proximity really to um, those other residential roads including Fuller's Way North but um, just really just to say I'd be interested to know if you had any soundproofing built into the design of the buildings um, and lastly um, um, I've actually I think that might be it and also that the, obviously where it's located is very near the A3 so I'm assuming that you're looking at this site, if I can make an assumption, based on the fact that it is near a motorway network. So you're probably anticipating that there will be traffic, hence 24 hours, um, with the access to, to the motorway network. But that, that is a concern for me, the 24 hours. So um, I would be looking maybe for some um, compromise on the 24 hour. But as I say, that they're my only comments at this stage. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank, thank you. Um, Councillor Reeve and then Councillor Wolfridge. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, we recognise that the, the, the borough is in need of additional industrial space, including warehousing and distribution facilities. Um, there's a very um, a, a, a big shortage uh, of, of these things, um, and that has an impact on our local economy and, and, and prosperity. Um, and, and, and employment um, in the area. But we do have to bear in mind that this is also a residential area and that any development that's done in this area has to, um, you know, take, has to be sensitive um, uh, to those needs. Um, one of the concerns that's been raised um, is uh, in, in this development and, and also with... Um, uh, the, 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 the roads in the area is the, uh, the traffic problem. Um, so I would uh, suggest that we uh, that perhaps talk about a, a Section 106 agreement um, to, with uh, to the developers to fund a, um, a traffic mitigation plan for the area um, after, after, of course, appropriate consultations with, with highways and, and um, some, uh, you know, to find the best solution uh, for the area. Thank you for that. Um, um, we'll take that, we've got that noted as a takeaway for the planning committee to consider. Um, Councillor Waldridge. Um, being the contrarian I am, so I apologise for this. You've, there are other units around here. Having walked around the site a number of times, myself and my, my colleague who's not here in the room today, at the moment, um, do you have any provision to acquire those additional sites in the short to medium term? And Sorry, um, and, uh, Councillor Waldridge, it's um, comments at the moment, so it's not questions. We've, we've finished with the questions. If you're going to do it to the... 
Yeah, I'm new, I'm so apologies. I know. Yeah, I yeah. know, that's why so, I'm, being, um, I'm seeing okay. it nicely. Um, so I, I, I'll ask a question. <laughs> trying to, I'll yeah, ask a question. Yeah, uh, uh, well, it, we're moved comments. on to comments. So, so maybe if you could put it as in a comment rather than a question to the applicant. That's going to be interesting. It's yeah. <laughs> an intellectual help, please. Um, <laughs> hmm? um, well, I think you know where I'm going on it, don't you? Have you, you know... <laughs> Chair, help me. How, how, how would you phrase it? How would you phrase it softly with regard to the acquisition of the other vacant sites? Um, I, I think you, you might have some concerns about the future, um, what is going to happen to the rest of Redline Estate, Thank you. and whether why, there is. That's why you're the chair. It, Thank you very much. What to, might take, what to take away, um, what the future, and whether uh, whether whether the the. App, uh, Applicant yeah, perfect. Yeah, thank you very ambitions. much. Yeah, is that, is that, uh, uh, the comment? I could yeah. have said it better. Thank you very much. <laughs> right. So uh, I'll stop my blithering. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, um, some comments. Um, I support the biodiversity officer's comment about further greening of the site. I support the flood officer's comment about uh, objecting to the application until all the matters relating to drainage are addressed. Um, I think when the officers look at the impact of the amenities yeah, on the... We can't hear it this end. When the officers look at the impact of on the amenities of other properties, they would be, use, it would be useful to also uh, talk to environmental health officers to see if there are any concerns by then. Um, and um, I have concerns that if uh, transport power policy is to try and mini minimise impact, I don't see how that is, that, how that <coughs> is minimised if you have a 24-hour usage. That, that, thank you for that, and, and I think that will be covered when they're looking. At, but we will take those comments away um, and add them to the list, but it should be looked at by the, the various um, departments within the council for the application, but thank you for that. Right, I think um, we'll finish there with the, the, the comments, um, and, and th those will be summarised and taken away. I think, are we happy that we, um, that we take that away? But that, you know, to, for me, there were to do with, with the level of traffic, um, the increased level of traffic and the size of it, um, some impact on, on light, uh, and um, then there, there was to do with maybe to looking at whether there would be, because of we're looking at that whole area with regard to the increase in traffic, maybe some section 106 for some traffic calming measures. Um, and um, I'm trying to think there's, looking at my notes. The 24 hours, was it noise in 24 hours was the, the other, and, and then screening between, um, between the, um, the advantage nursery and and also screening on on the, on the front the greening well I call, call it greening within the site but the, you've probably got a lot more detailed notes those are the ones that are jumping out at me but they're yeah, I think, those okay. the key ones yeah okay so we can take that away and and pass that on to the, the planning committee for their additional notes so th thank you very much for coming this evening thank you residents for coming along I would urge you again as I've said a few times if you want to register on the website um, your comments uh, they will all be looked at by the, the planning officers and taken into account with the final when the final paper is brought to committee I'm not sure when that is um, but but they, and they will also um, take into account what uh, we've said tonight um, and, um, and if you have registered, then you're kept up to date with the application. So that's another reason for making sure that you do put your comments in. All right. Thank you very much for that. And thank you for coming this evening. Um, if we can move on to the next planning application, which is uh, sorry, planning, planning consultation, um, which is. Sorry. Oh, yes. Yes, sorry. Um, if Councillor Gonzalez can come back in again. Yes, let's, let's give yeah, just a few minutes break before the next one. So, sorry to, to the people who are waiting for Hillcroft. I know it's been a long evening. I apologise, but it's...
<laughs> well, it's, 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 this me, is what happens when you've... Sorry, I'll put... Yeah. That's okay. Right. Okay, I think we've still got a few councillors are not here, but um, given it's not a planning decision item, we can start without them returning, I think. Um, so, um, the, the second um, consultation on our agenda for this evening is Hillcroft in um, South, and South Bank in, in Suburban Hill Ward. Um, we have got, uh, again, the, the same as the last time, we've got the applicant here. I, I'm not cu quite sure... Who, who we'll, have inter we'll introduce ourselves, perhaps. Right, OK, talk. that's fine. Um, again, if you've got 10 to 15 minutes, you can use the 15 minutes, but please, you know, if you... I'll leave it up to you, but that's... Um, I'll give you 15 minutes to, to do your introduction. It's not very long, but it's all you'll get at the planning committee as well. <laughs> Thank you, Chair and Councillors. Uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Professor Andrew George. I am the Chair of Governors of Richmond and Hillcroft Adult and Community College, uh, a well-known and established... Uh, adult Education College based in Surbiton and, and in Richmond. Really grateful for an opportunity to present. I'm going to take not very much time because we need to get into the meat of it with the design. But really excited about the opportunity that this offers. Really interested to hear the comments that people are going to have. Um, but really excited about the opportunity to provide a hub that's going to provide facilities for the community and also providing uh, educational opportunities, especially for disadvantaged people, um, and to build on our strong history uh, and our expertise uh, in making routes through to employment and to well-being. Um, and I must just speak personally today, after having spent this afternoon uh, awarding the awards for the best students we've got, the difference that you see made to people's lives is just fantastic, uh, and that's what's motivating us behind uh, this application. Uh, and so I've got a large team here, including the principal and various consultants, but in sake, for sake of time, I'll just go straight to Leo, uh, who is our architect, who will be providing a backdrop to the whole one, and then the rest of us will be uh, willing to listen and also to answer questions. Thank you. Good evening, panel. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Leonardo Pelleriti, and I hope you will understand my accent. It's a bit strong, but hopefully it will be right. Um, you, obviously will, you can stop to ask me questions. Um, obviously, this site is a fantastic opportunity for the area. In these images, we just showing the site, which is showing with the red boundary. On the, right, the left-hand side, you can see the plan and coming from you know, the top of Serviton Station, then you have to the left, to the west boundary, uh, the Glenbach House apartment block, and then we have the, the Glenbach Studios. Then we have in the middle of the site, which is approximately 1.6 hectares, we have uh, a building built in the 60s, 70s, which was used as a student accommodation for the college. The college itself, it currently sits on a grade two listed building, which is basically to um, the right top of that image. Um, you can see also to the right one image of, of the existing building, and you can see and understand the beauty and, and you know, the importance of, of the site. Uh, the college has been using this uh, facility for a few decades now, and obviously this building, because of uh, his history and you know, uh, the importance, is not fit to purpose at the moment to fulfill, I would say, uh, the ambition of the college and, and the future expectations to receive more students. So the idea came up to say, okay, how can our side where we are sitting and where we have been for many years, how we can uh, develop our educational purpose. We try to... Yes. I'm just trying to... Yeah. So essentially, um, I will go through quickly and, you know, the 
initial concept and, and the architecture of, of the proposal. I think it's fair to say that the scheme has been for uh, three pre four pre-application meetings, which were received very positively. And we have uh, gone through two planning review panels, which as well were received very positively with very positive comments. And as well, um, the scheme has already received um, GLA funding for the development. And the site present a number of opportunities and I would say challenges to start with. Obviously, we're sitting in a 1.6 hectare woodland. Obviously, we have a number uh, of three protected and orders, TPOs called. Obviously, we are working in a conservation area, which is quite, it was quite important since the beginning of, of the scheme. We have a grade two listed building on site. Obviously, we are dealing with wildlife and, and ecology. And as you can see from uh, the sketch from the right, the topography of the site is quite challenging. So there are so many changing levels from top to bottom. And obviously, in terms of planning, try to resolve questions of overlooking and, and definitely the orientation, how we were planning to orientate uh, our new buildings or our new proposal. It's fair to say, since the beginning, before even put any drawing forward or any concept forward, the first key uh, consultants on, on the scheme were a tree consultant and ecologist. Uh, I'm lucky today I have the ecologist here uh, with us that you know, will help us to answer any questions. Uh, this is, I'm sorry. Yeah. So these are the original, the initial uh, concept diagrams and how we started looking at the site uh, to, uh, together with the client. And obviously, starting from the left, a diagram shows the importance of of the trees on site, and, and from the analysis and from the surveys we had during uh, the, you know, the, the start of the project, obviously we identify the importance of those trees. Those elements were kind of living spaces in between, which are the second diagram showing in pink, and how then any potential orientation or any sun penetration to the site and following the urban grid around our beautiful site could be organized. And it's the result of a very simple, I would say, uh, diagram, which tried to propose uh, a scheme that creates a series of pavilions or buildings sitting between the landscape and between the trees. So I think that was a very important element during the design, the trees and the ecology, and how our buildings were sitting within this beautiful context. The result of this you know, uh, years of analysis derived in, in this, uh, well, I'll show you here, which is um, the proposed master plan. The overall idea of this scheme is to regenerate or re, um, um, the word doesn't come to my, to my mouth, but is to re look at the great two listed building, try to bring it back to its original uh, use, which is a residential building, it hasn't been built to be a college. So it's to restore the beauty of that building, convert it back to residential, to create on site a residential building with, um, Dividing the site in residential and the student uh, element, or you know the college, uh, or the educational element of the site, with um, part of the site supporting that uh, aim, which is you know moving forward with the college on site and regenerating the site, creating a new hub for the local community. So the master plan show, as you can see, uh, to uh, to the left, to the top, is uh, the H-shape new uh, facility for the college. 
And to the south of the site, we have other two small buildings. One is a crash, which is in support to, to the main college. As you know, this is an adult education center, so there would be um, you know, students with kids that will need to be supported for uh, their time. So there is a crash in support uh, as a facility. And in addition to that, we have a new small residential building, which is linked in a way to the restore grade two listed building. So the two main components of the site is the residential part to, to, to the east and the college to the west. To the right, you can see and one initial uh, visualization uh, the, is the entrance of the college from South Bank. And, and I think it's quite a nice uh, view with a new building working with the landscape um, being welcoming to people uh, entering the college. We have on the ground floor a number of community facilities like cafeteria, reception, there will be meeting rooms for people to use and so on. This is a, an elevation basically taking through the site from north to south is looking from the entrance from South, South Bank and this very gentle uh, slow getting people into the site and then into the college. Walking downside the college and connecting them to the rear of the site where the smaller building is located which is the crash that is serving the college. The college itself is, is, is only two story. You can see in the background and uh, the great two listed building and we think that the college sits well within, uh, within the site uh, in relation to the great two listed building. And obviously you have the beautiful landscape and the, beaut the beautiful trees that are retained on site. This is a cross section um, from the south of the site. If you, if you see bottom right, you can see the plan with indication where the section is taken. So you see from left to right the Glenback uh, house, which is a five-story building. Obviously, there is a clear boundary. Then you can appreciate how the topography of the site changed quite significantly from the bottom to the top. So in this image, you see uh, the trees. You see in the background the college and the crash. The building you see to the front is the new residential building located to the rear of the site, which is a, four, um, is a ground floor plus three-story residential building, which uh, will accommodate 13 units. In the foreground, you can see as well the great two-listed building, and the top right of the image is the Limehouse School to the top of the site. It's fair to say that uh, the scheme has been uh, following you know, consultation with, with the public after you know, pre-apps and uh, the sun review panels. We have a public consultation last summer organized in, in the college with you know, many people came, many people made comments, asked questions. Obviously, people were worried about the trees, concerned about the ecology, and what is happening with this building. So we have several discussions. We try to uh, reassure people that everything we're doing here is within with trees and working with the ecology. And so in a way, we are enhancing uh, uh, the qualities of, of the site. At the time, we have created a few images because there were some concerns about you know, how visible the new residential building will be from Oak Hill Path. And so we create two views that basically show that the building is screened by the existing trees, by the natural landscape, and is not really seen either from the listed building or from the south. I hope this plan is, uh, you can understand, is quite complex, so we, as part of the application, obviously we have a very extensive trees report and ecology report, but I think we wanted just to 
be uh, upfront in regards to you know what we're doing with trees. What are the trees that, uh, in a way, will be removed to uh, allow uh, the development to move forward? But I have to uh, to say that those trees that are going to be removed, they are coming from several consultations with trees officer, with our consultants, surveys, and they are all trees of low or very poor quality. Not to say that, obviously, every tree you remove has an importance. However, um, there is the number of trees we are replanting on site, and the, you know, the restoration of the understory of, of, of the site in terms of uh, you know, its, quality, its um, ecological quality, um, replacing, uh, in a way, um, the under uh, woodland, the under, the under layer of the woodland with diverse, uh, diverse small trees and, and ground flora, all of these elements will significantly enhance the, you know, the, ecolog the ecological values of the site it itself. In fact, there is a, a report that shows the net gain and increase in regards to the new development in respect to the existing site. Obviously, I have here in this meeting our ecologist. He will be more than happy to uh, spend two minutes to describe what we're doing in terms of ecology and trees. The diagram to, uh, to the right is essentially showing and highlighting in color all the trees that we are retaining, that are retained on site, which are these kind of clouds elements. And then in color, you see all the new trees we are replanting. There, is, there are opportunities, I think, to increase this number of trees, but this is going to be subject to additional surveys because we need to understand better um, the root protection areas of the existing trees. As you can see, the site is very heavily uh, occupied by trees. In regards to uh, the other part of the development, which is um, the restoration of the Great Two listed building, and this is a view of how the building is formed. So we have the pink and yellow, which is the original uh, 1877 uh, house, with in red shows the extension built in the 70s. Within, obviously, that extension is not adding any quality to, to the existing building. We think it's a bit detrimental, and obviously we have our heritage consultant here to confirm that. So the idea is to bring back the great two listed building to uh, its original uh, footprint and, and beauty, which are you know, the historic images showing to the right. Um, in, sorry, I, I mean, we have got to the 15 minute. minutes now, so the, you, yeah. So, yeah. the existing building we are retaining, we are demolishing um, the new extension built in the 70s to restore the original footprint of the building. We are adding a new extension to the building, which is in diagram four, is the L-shaped uh, small building to the north. And then we are recreating and rediscovering the landscape around the building. These are um, briefly the plans of the Great Two Listed Building and the connections to the rear side where the new residential building will sit. And, and this is in principle the architectural expression of obviously the Great Two Listed Building would be restored and kept as it is. And the new addition which try not to be um, in contrast with existing building but at the same time trying to be a, a modern piece of design. Thank you. Th th thank you very much for Sorry that. Sorry if, if um, I took it know, longer. It's, it's just, um, you know, it's just a, a busy evening, and we, yeah. um, but thank you. And there may well be an opportunity for you to say more once we of hear course, the, the comments from, we've got some residents who want to speak, and I'm sure the, there may well be some questions from the, the councillors as well. So do you want to go back? Um, and, thank you very much. We'll, sorry. Um, so, see you. Um, the first, um, I've got three people who, is there more than, oh, no, no, no. there are three people who would like to speak, and if I could um, start with uh, Nicole Bisson. 
Thanks, Chair, and great pronunciation. <laughs> Fiona told me I had three minutes, and I'm on the late shift, so I'll, I'll keep it quick. So my name is Nicole Bisson. I'm a director of the Residents Association at South Bank Lodge. We're situated directly across the road from Hillcroft College site. We submitted an eight-page um, objection to this application, but I won't go through the details of that here for everyone's sake. Um, for my sins, I'm also a former senior advisor to the Minister for Planning in the Australian Government, so I just wanted to declare that. But tonight, I want to talk to you about my home and the homes of the 40 other families that live in South Bank Lodge, as well as our numerous other neighbours uh, on the South Bank. South Bank, as you may know, uh, has a few different landscapes. Firstly, you've got the hustle and bustle of Surbiton Station at one end, you've got the multi-storey car park, and shortly the redevelopment of that site with hundreds of flats. At the other end, you have the increasingly busy Ewell Road. But in between, you've got South Bank Lodge, um, and you've got this beautiful green uh, oasis where you've got people living in small flats with no gardens of their own. Residents here gain a valuable respite from the bustle and ongoing development at Surbiton Station, from the wonderful, tree-filled and biodiversity-rich site of Hillcroft College. If we look out our windows to the right-hand side, we see trains. But if we look out to the south, it's a real treat. So many of my neighbours, including me, chose South Bank to live because of the trees. It's like you're in a hidden oasis. There is bird life, badgers, deer, foxes, bats, any number of wonderful creatures who often remain hidden during the day but come out to play at night. I don't object to the college wanting to improve its classrooms for the sake of education, but what I and our community object to is doing this at the expense of our incredibly important natural habitat. This application is asking council to approve the removal of 73 trees, tearing down a beautiful nature-lined streetscape of South Bank, and replacing this greenery with bitumen, a row of bins, and some car parking at the front. It doesn't matter that some of these trees are self-seeded. Like a self-seeded forest, what matters is that these trees allow us to breathe cleaner air. This application is asking council to put at risk our local wildlife, including putting flats alongside a nature reserve, and removing one of the two badger sets that live on site. No wonder that the Badger Report had not for public consumption written on its front cover before we found it. This application has grossly underrepresented the impact that the development would have on biodiversity by conducting wildlife studies at times of the year when that wildlife is the least active. All this to move classes from one building to another. What positive gain will the community have from allowing this application? There's no affordable housing provision. There is an unacceptable impact on the trees and wildlife and it will replace our natural public amenity with concrete, bins, and car parks. Every time we go outside, we'll have the noise and nuisance from rubbish bins and vehicles, rather than bird life and nature. That beautiful photograph on the right-hand side that shows the entrance, the entire right-hand side of the picture is actually where the bins and the car park and the entrance will be, not those trees because they will be removed. In its own recent evaluation of the disposal of Surbiton Station car park, council officers importantly and rightly highlighted that amongst a comprehensive landscape strategy, planting on the boundary of a site is particularly important to soften the frontage and to provide a buffer from homes. The Hillcroft application in its current state flies in the face of Council's own comments at a time where Council's most appropriate interests lie in making the redevelopment of the Surbiton Station car park and the surrounding land a success. This street and our neighbourhood can't support both of these projects at once. A decision has to be made to encourage development where it's most appropriate, but not where it will have an unsustainable, unaffordable and unacceptable impact on public amenity. So I ask you, can we really afford to lose this much greenery and biodiversity for the sake of moving classrooms from one building to another? The residents of South Bank say no. Okay, that, that, thank you for, for that. For that. Um, do, would you like to come yeah. make any comments or uh, yes, sorry, yeah, answer any questions? We have here um, our ecologists, and might we like to say a word about uh, what we're doing in terms of ecology to the site? Yeah, I'll just come back on a few of those points. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, as Leo said in his initial presentation, this design has been ecology-led right from the start. We've been involved um, since 2018, and the whole process started with detailed you know, botanical surveys, badger surveys, bat surveys, reptile surveys, 
Um, the main constraints on site and the protected species that are present are badgers and bats. Um, the buildings and all of their alignment on site has been specifically located in line with the original biodiversity plan to go in the areas of least biodiversity interest. Um, most of it avoids impacts to you know, most of the wildlife that we're dealing with on site. There is a badger set in proximal to uh, the it's, residential building. Yeah. That has been, through our surveys that we did in 2020, that was shown to be a kind of mainly disused annex set to the main set, which is going to be fully retained, which is in the southeast corner of the site. And that, in the latest you know, consultations between ecologists, landscape architects, and the county ecologist, that's proposed to be an entirely kind of sectioned off area of woodland with limited public access. Um, and that's something that's been uh, you know, consulted on. Um, just to go back on the Badger point, the Badger report is not widely spread around because uh, that's standard practice in ecological consultancy because we don't want people to know where Badgers are so that they could potentially persecute them. So we always have Badger reports as confidential. Thank you for those points of clarification. Um, I've got um, James Riding, who would like to, um, would you like to come and yeah, sure. say, make yeah. some comments? Thank you. Um, um, is this on? Yes, fine. Yeah, you don't need it anyway. So, um, yes, yeah, so I, I have um, also... Um, looked at this uh, application and I've also been to meet with, um, with, with the college and um, with Leonardo as well. Um, my main concern about this is the impact on the conservation area and the, 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 the number of trees that will be lost. And have, I, the reason I went to meet them was because I needed to understand more for myself about exactly where I'm talking particularly about the residential block on the east side, um, about exactly where that was. Um, it's very difficult to work out, um, although you can see the plan there, exactly where that falls. But also, the other thing that struck me was how, how big, how uh, much bigger the development is in the plans to what I originally uh, saw what I originally was aware of. Um, so that's still, and, and the number of trees that are actually going to be lost, which sev some 70 odd trees, um, that's significant. Um, also, we, one of the other concerns I had was about the future, about what happens in the future, because uh, if the, the, the land to the east is no longer part of Hillcroft and it's uh, someone else who's developing it, then Hillcroft won't know, you know, that's, out, that's in the lap of the gods, really. We don't know that. So that, that piece of land disappears and what will happen to the, say, things like the replanting? Um, so my, I, I suppose my concern is uh, it's a fantastic piece of conservation area. It's a green space. Why do we need this residential block there? With regards to the, um, with regards to the, the building, the, the listed building, that's a wonderful building. I mean, it's, it's a beautiful building. It's, it was previously Bryant and May. I, I, I think it's great. I've seen inside it. To develop that building is great. Um, but I see the residential block as unnecessary to, to the whole thing, really. And um, a huge mass concreting of, I mean, it's four stories high. It's much bigger when I looked at, I think it's 400, I looked at about 400 square meters, which is huge. And I know when I went to visit that it was nothing like that. Um, it, um, so, that's what it appears to be to me, and it, it looks like, um, yeah, it looks like an unnecessary, um, 
an unnecessary thing, an un unnecessary building, um, and which will also have a negative impact on wildlife, because you can't replace wildlife. Um, and as for the trees, well, how do we know that the trees will be replanted? How do we know that in the future that piece of land won't be taken up and that planting will never happen and we'll just have lost those trees altogether? So I really feel, I'm, I'm quite passionate about the area. I've, I've lived in Surbiton since 91. Um, at Valley Place, we're right next door to it. Um, so I'd hate to see that kind of development, so that mass development and the impact that that has on you know, um, the surrounding residential area. And so that's, that's really it. Thank you very much for asking me to speak. And um, that, that's what I have to say. I hope that's um, okay for now. If I've got any more questions, I might ask as well, if that's all right. Okay, yeah, thanks. Yes, well, um, thank you I mean, uh, that is, that's fine, James. And all if right. you can just, um, again, if there's anything else, you just put it into the, the planning yeah. portal. Okay, thanks. Yeah, th thank you for that. Do, would you like to come back on any of those yes. points? Hi, uh, Nick Jenkins of Smith Jenkins Planning Consultant, so the planning lead on the project. Just wanted to come back on a couple of uh, points made uh, by the two speakers so far, and also invite my colleague up, Paul Crisp, who leads the heritage um, aspects of this project. So just three or four fairly short points, really. Um, there was mention of planting on the boundary by the first speaker in terms of access to the site. The access we're proposing is... Um, not materially wider than the existing access. So at the moment, the, the site has two access points. We're talking about the access point on the left-hand side or the west. Um, that access is being shuffled slightly to the left, um, but we're not creating you know, a brand new access point there and not having uh, frontage planting. Just in relation to trees, um, just need to be very careful when um, counting trees and saying we're, we're losing you know, 73, 71, is it 75, 62? Um, the number I have is 71, uh, trees being lost. Um, 43 of these are very small holly and sycamore trees that are in two rows towards the rear of the site. Um, as to whether they're you know, trees per se, because they're so small, but you know, that's not one for me now, but, but that's 43 of the 71. There are then two U-value trees on the site that need to come out in any event, so that leaves 26 trees. Um, of those 26 trees, 10 of those are category B trees, so not category A, no category A sites on, category A trees on site are being lost. Um, so the 26 we're left with, there's 10 category B, 14 category C trees, and of those, there are two TPO trees being up front here. There's one, which is tree T5, which is to the rear of the existing college building, which is a sycamore and there's tree T29 that is to the frontage to the left of the new access point, which basically is, it needs to come out in any event. So that's where we are with the numbers of trees being removed. 71, 43 are very small, two are you, that leaves 26. And in terms of new trees being planted, uh, the number is 33 at the moment. We can only plant so many new trees on site to, in, to ensure sufficient spread between trees and also to preserve, for example, the, the very large lawn area to the rear of the listed building, which is very important to the significance of that, of that building. And I don't have a number of trees that are on site being retained because that's a very high number, but you know, I don't have that before me. Just in terms of a slightly different subject in terms of the need for the residential block and the comment that there's no affordable housing in the scheme. So this development, unashamedly, is a new college redevelopment scheme. Building the new college, which will be absolutely bang up to date, modern facilities, catering for all of the students and staff of the college, including you know, accessible access for the first time for many years, is gonna cost a lot of money. Putting a green roof on it costs money. Putting PV panels on it costs money. The timber cladding on the building costs money. Um, Leo, the architect, costs money. 
It's a great scheme. It's a high quality scheme. Two design review panels, lots of consultation with the council. That's a new college building, along with the creche, which is ancillary to the college building. For the avoidance of doubt, it's not a commercial nursery. It will be operated as a creche by the college, just in case we start falling into areas of, uh, you know, um, nursery pick up and drop off and things like that and traffic. So it's a creche just for the college. So those are the two aspects being uh, built by the college. They're big aspirations for the future and for them to remain in Surbiton. The listed building is obviously being converted to residential with a small extension and a new residential building to the rear. Those two residential elements are purely there to generate funds to build the new college. And the funds those residential developments will generate won't even really touch the sides of the costs to build the new college. There's GLA funding and there's other funds coming from the, the college itself. So that's why the new residential is needed. And it's been very carefully planned to fit into the surrounding landscape. In terms of any comments about um, impact on the conservation area and the listed building, They've all been carefully considered. If you wanted to hear more on that, including the, the buy-in we have from the council's heritage consultant and Historic England, as I say, my colleague Paul is here and can address those points if you're interested, but I don't want to take up your time if not needed. Um, I, think, I think that Thank was you. quite a, a good answer. Um, I think um, the point is well, well made that um, there are, um, if it's in a conservation area, if it's listed, then there are some additional requirements. So, so, so that would be, and that would be covered within the, the planning document. So I, I think that Absolutely. should be, uh, just for point of clarification, that, that would be taken into account when we're looking okay. at this. So Thank, fa you. thank you very much. For Hopefully that. my quick canter yep. so across quite good. a few subjects was useful. Thank, thank you. Um, I've got... Um, is Claire Mellish here? Okay, Claire, Claire, would you like to come forward? Hi, um, Claire Mellish, I'm a member of the Kingston Society and um, Kingston Biodiversity Network and also um, Secretary of the Alpha Road Estate Residents Association. I live there. I'm very interested in women's education as well, which is one aspect that I'm disappointed in, in terms of um, the loss of that to this site and its historic association. But I would like, you know, if this is ecology-led, I would like clarification about why there's no mention of the extensive and significant under, underground features at Hillcroft. I mean, it's missed by all the reports, the heritage report, the archeological report, the ecological surveys. And it's very significant in terms of bats because Natura's bats was one of the rare ones that they heard. Um, they hibernate in caves and in tunnels. So it could be a significant site but that hasn't been looked at. But it's also, because they're Victorian and World War II tunnels, it's a heritage thing too. And they could be, the Victorian one could actually be connected to the house, which supposedly doesn't have a cellar, which seems very odd for a grand old Victorian house. I would be very surprised that it wasn't connected in some way. But what's not presented in any of this is any plan of those tunnels or any discussion of it to do with heritage or ecology. So I'd like to see that. Um, they also contribute to potential site engineering issues, you know, in terms, and that would affect viability. So it's important that the, the tunnels are put forward for everyone to understand. Um, ecology again, why no assessment of veteran trees, which is irreplaceable habitat under the NPPF? And now, arboricultural reports, well, they don't tend to assess veteran trees or say whether trees are veterans or not. They're to do with, you know, this is a good tree, it's a category B, it's a category A or whatever. Veteran trees are to do with wounding, age, decay, dead wood. They're to do with habitat for wildlife and that's why they are irreplaceable. And the council will miss out on adequate compensation if they don't get an assessment of all veteran trees on that site and there are a lot of them. And... Uh, 
the air. The Ground and Aerial Tree Bat Survey mentioned a veteran, only one veteran tree, but they were looking at a subset of trees, and that was, um, they called for its retention, but it's still going to have to go, according to the plan, even though it's incredibly valuable. Um, but there are many others, according to ecologists, on that site. Then, I won't go into all the arguments about the trees, but I will just give one example. The tree that they said was on the, on the corner of the South Bank where the new entrance will go. In the landscape statement, it was not a TPO. In the design and access statement, it was shown as a TPO in category A, which it is in. In the Albora Corridor Assessment, it's a TPO, but described as, um, oh yeah, it was a high landscape contribution, moderate vitality, but many years of predicted life, 20 plus, but it's going to be removed to create the new entrance and car park. But in the community engagement report, they said it was dead. So it's all, you know, I just don't feel that it's being very honest with us about the tree situation. So that's what I'll say about that. Um, the tricks, the transport report, traffic estimates used incorrect building use classes, which were different to the actual application form, so there's a real anomaly there. And they estimated that there'd be fewer vehicle movements as a result of the new development, which I think anyone living nearby would think was nonsense. And it was just a desk-based thing with an algorithm defining it as um, a college, but it, it said it was... Um, I said it wasn't residential, it shouldn't be residential, but I don't know. I really think that needs to be looked ground truthed in some way. I don't believe the, the uh, transport report. Then um, the application form claims brownfield and no loss in garden land, but the new residential flats and creche are to be built on top of recognised Victorian woodland gardens and an urban wildlife haven. The new college also takes out gardens four times the footprints of the existing Powell House building. It's recognised garden on London Park and Garden website, so I don't really think it's just brown field to be described like that. No affordable housing and the viability assessment, which we've just been hearing about. Well, I live on council estate, Alpha Road nearby, and it, that was used. <laughs> Some of our places there were used in the assessment to compare. So far cheaper housing. They would not, I don't believe, the viability assessment. Um, the, 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 the Oak Hill Path pictures that we saw, where it said it was, you know, you wouldn't see this residential block. What does that look like in winter? I mean, those look, you know, lots of trees screening there, but I think that, that, that was a summer picture, basically. Because at the moment, essentially, it's a woodland walk between two areas of woodland. And um, now there'll be a, a big block of flats with garden areas sort of really quite close by. I mean, maybe you get biodiversity net gain, but biodiversity net gain doesn't look at wildlife. And I cannot see impacts to the badgers being very positive with all those people and events and things happening. Uh, in terms of that as well, I fear that there isn't... They didn't look at the impacts to the Richard Jeffries Bird Reserve and the wood. They looked at the... That's barely mentioned, and yet that's, that's where the connectivity must lie for the animals that live on site. They probably come from the railway embankment as well. Up south side, you know, there's a path that's along the railway embankment that you can get through. And um, then they would come through and then on to the wood and the bird reserve. But there doesn't seem to be any overview of how it affects animals' roots in and out of the, the site. In fact, they removed the one huge long hedge along the back of Glen Bark all the way down there. They leave a fragment of it and they split off, whoops, <laughs> another bit at the other side of the site near the building and the formal gardens. So there's no connectivity for wildlife left there. You've got two fragments, and I, so I don't believe the biodiversity net gain calculations at all for that, for the linear features. In fact, the residential block is on top of a double hedgerow, which has collapsed, it's um, grown up and collapsed in on itself, of yew and hornbeam, I believe. But that, there's no mitigation for the loss of that double linear feature there. Yeah, that's most of my points. <laughs>
Thank, thank you very much. That was a very uh, comprehensive. Do you want to come back on any of, of yeah, those comments? If, if you one is heritage, and right. then social housing. Okay. All right. If, if you, I mean, I'm going to just I say, be, just given I'll the time scale, and, and we've still got to hear from the councillors as well. So if if you can be brief, because we, you know, it's you have given brief. an outline of the of, of the the biodiversity and, and the bats and things Absolutely. previously. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Good evening, councillors. My name is Paul Crisp and I've been advising on the heritage impacts of the proposals. It's just to pick up at the point about the tunnels uh, and the World War II bunker, is that there is a World War II bunker on site. Uh, it's currently infilled with concrete, so it's completely inaccessible. Uh, it has two parts which are above ground, one which is a manhole cover, and the other which is an entrance to the site, which when you look into it, you can see the concrete there. Uh, the intention is actually that there's potential there for actually making it into a bat roost possibly, so actually we can improve uh, that aspect for some of the bats as well. In terms of the tunnels, we've looked through the, uh, through, the, through the existing college building and haven't been able to find any connection which would go to the west. We've undertaken a ground penetrating survey uh, and there's nothing there that we've been able to find as a built uh, element in the landscape. And bearing in mind that the height of the uh, floor level of the college down to where the new building is, is about a four metre drop. Any structure which would be connecting the, connecting the two structures, or anything in tunnels would, and in there, would be fairly substantive structures. So everything that we found at the moment, we found no possible remnant of any tunnel, uh, and there doesn't seem to be anything in there that we've been able to find. Um, as, as mentioned, the tunnel's already on our hit list for enhancement for bats, so that's, that's been covered already, and that can be have a new access point and be enhanced as a hibernation roost, which is less suitable for at the moment. Um, just to come back on the tree points, um, the vast majority of trees that have been retained on site are all of the nice old oak trees. There's, there's no decent oaks being removed from the project. There was one that was down for removal, tree 34, which is the one that's being referred to as the veteran tree, which is not quite a veteran yet, but may be if it gets there. That, following the tree climbing inspection, which I undertook myself, uh, we found it had very high bat potential and recommended that it was retained. And the design team being you know, very amenable to the ecological perspective have decided to keep that now. And they're now planning around that. So again, that demonstrates the kind of you know, real acceptance of ecology and the importance of the trees for screening on the site. Um, the, there will be a lot of removal of uh, rhododendron and cherry laurel and non-native um, you know, historic landscaping trees, uh, up except for when they're required for screening around the outside of the site. Um, most of it's going to be removed from the inside of the site and replaced with the wildflower plant planting mix, which will be mixed um, tree shrubs and also an understory mix of wildflower you know, seeds, you know, the, the typical woodland species. That's how we've achieved the net gain on site. We've gone from a very poor quality woodland dominated by cherry laurel to getting rid of all of that and keeping all of the significant trees, apart from some you know, squirrel damaged sycamores and things like that, um, and then really trying to enhance all of the retained space with an uh, ecologically led landscaping scheme. And the net gain has been demonstrated uh, at 32%, which is well above what we're you know, normally required in planning applications. Um, with regard to habitat corridors, you can see on the plan behind you that there's significant linear corridors going to be going right through the site. Um, so those can still be used by bats for foraging routes, there's going to be new woodland planting areas um, just in the southeast side of the site where the badger set is at the moment. The area that's kind of shown as grass, that's actually going to be replanted with a woodland mix uh, so that the badgers have got additional protection. So that's the area of the site that's going to be kind of restricted access um, and is, is not going to be encouraged in, in those areas. Um, yeah, and the, we have done an assessment on linear features, but you know, we showed it to have a 45% gain of linear features in the biodiversity assessment, but as has been pointed out, it's a, it's a fairly 
arbitrary way of at the moment we've just got an absolute mass of trees um, so there's not many I, clearly identifiable linear features that are being lost but there will be plenty retained in the future and lots of planting going in um, that's fine. thank you for that thank you great um, th thank you so I think we'll, um, that's all the questions from um, um, okay Okay, just uh, very quick, but uh, we've got, um, that's the, the end of the, at this point, this will be the end, end of it before the councillors can ask some questions, so they may well uh, have a... Absolutely, but I'll just say, I am Gabe Flint, I'm the principal, and I just wanted to clarify one point, that we're still providing Hillcroft Women's Education programmes at the, at the Surbiton site, and we've got many classes that are for women only at both sites. Um, and women's education will be preserved, but as part of the broader, diverse and inclusive um, curriculum. And our learner population across both sites is 75% female. So, thank, you. thank you for that clarification. Okay, um, I'm, I'm, I know you've put your hands up, but we're, we're now at that point. They had to be registered to speak, and we have heard a lot. If there's any comments you want to make, you can make it on the planning portal. You can go to the, the website and, and add it. Okay, sorry, no, we, I, I can't. Well, if you register or if you look on the planning portal, then you will find when, when it will come. If you register, then they will probably let you know. Um, actually, I, I think they will let you know when the, the plans are coming to commit. They, they will let those that have objected to or, or supported um, the, when it's coming. Um, it can be refused under delegated powers, so in which case you... You won't get invited to a meeting uh, if it gets refused under delegated powers by officers. If the officers recommend permit for it, it will then come to a planning committee. That will only allow five minutes for all objectors. You have to share your five minutes, and the applicant only has five minutes as well at those meetings. So, But you will find out when it's coming if it's recommended for permission. Okay, that, thank you for, for that. Clarification. That's, that was my understanding. So that, that's good. Thank you, Councillor Green. Um, so if we can just go on to, um, if there's any councillors have got any questions. So questions, not comments, questions. Councillor Manders, Councillor Herring. Um, Chair, I'm not going to use my microphone. I'm on the tired of silence tonight. Uh, I don't know why we didn't have this. The only problem is that it won't be recorded. And I think it would be, if you could just do it. Uh, I appreciate your comments, and this isn't our normal location, um, okay. and be hopefully back to, to normal at the next meeting. Uh, okay, if you could. It's just for recording purposes. Uh, right, okay. Well, I actually think the sound is worse with the um, sound system off rather than before. And I would like to know, Chair, the benefit of the sound man there, why we keep on getting this, uh, this feedback noise as well. Um, from the laptop, so, anyway, I'd, I'd like to be told afterwards. Um, okay, in terms of. Where is that? Sorry, it, it's fine. If we can just carry on, because we'll I think it's... It, we'll it keeps on being a, it's a feedback noise, a yelp, yelping noise that keeps on going. No, no, no it's, it, it's only at certain evening. times, and we did hear it. But, but if we can... Uh, the only problem is, uh, Captain Manders, is if we don't do it, then it won't be heard on the recording, which no, will no, be I, upload, I, I, uh, uploaded. So I did, that's I did really hear you, the reason. I did hear you the first time, yeah. Chair. OK, well, to my questions, actually, specifically to the uh, developers... Okay, I've got two questions. Um, uh, I can't find anywhere in the report about the energy ratings of the buildings uh, that you're going to do and the conversion of the existing buildings. Um, and related to that, what is the heating system that you're going to be used uh, for the buildings? And then my second question is, uh, will there be continuity of the educational provision on site? In other words, will the educational buildings be completed first so that there's a direct move, as it were, out of the old building into the new building. Who would like to take that? I'll give it a go. So, firstly, um, you just referred to the developers. Um, there are no developers for this site. The, uh, the college are leading on this project. So it's not a, not a commercial developer scheme. It's a college-led scheme. So it's just a, a small point, but it's quite probably quite an important one. In terms of continuity of um, provision, the new college building will be built and complete, ready for occupation before 
the existed, existing college building um, is um, reused or converted. So there will be continuity provision. In terms of the energy rating, the scheme of the new college um, is being built to a BRIAM excellent rating. Its heating system, as far as I'm aware, um, as you can appreciate as a planner, I've got an over, overriding knowledge of all aspects of the scheme, but not, no, not a specialist in, in any particular one, but it's an, it's an air source heat pump. Okay, I'll leave, I'll leave Leo to respond. He's, uh, he's told me to uh, move on. So obviously, in, in the five minutes presentation, we didn't touch much on uh, the sustainability and energy aspect of, of the scheme. Obviously, we are looking to design the buildings, how we're doing, trying to completely minimize the use of energy, working hard on the buildings and the envelope. Obviously, we are using aerosol heat pumps for heating in the college and in the new listed building. But it is essentially, uh, we are looking for a high level of sustainability on this development. Even the use of the materials, you know, we, we have to define how we want to build this one. And, but, you know, there is an opportunity to be using timber to build the buildings, the new buildings. So there is a focused attention to sustainability on this scheme. Obviously, we can spend uh, a lot of time to talk about that. But I can reassure you, in terms of energy, we're using aerosol heat pumps in, in terms of heating for both buildings, uh, education, and residential. We are trying to minimize any use of cooling in the college building using natural ventilation as much as possible. And with only some areas on which we need some minimal amount of cooling. So that is the strategy. Thank you for that. Um, um, I'm, I'm probably just because of, of the time. I'm going to say, can we just uh, can we take it? Can you take? Well, I will, I've noted it down. We'll note it down that it's something that we we okay, would want them to look at. Yes. Yes. Of course, we, we can send you the reports, the energy reports, and is, by is our that energy consultant. A report that's on. It's available online. It's, yes, it's it is online. available online. So, so you should be able to, to if you go yeah. to the planning are, documents online, it should be there. There are two reports, one for the college, and there is another one for the residential uh, part of, of the scheme. Okay, yeah, it's, it's on, all, should be all be on the planning portal. So if you look there under the record. Okay, thank, thanks. Um, Councillor Herling. Sorry. Thank you. Um, on the report, um, you indicated the highways um, team wanted the car parking to be uh, to be to be car free apart from disabled parking. And I sort of note on the figures you've got 20 parking places, of which four are disabled. Um, so, is there any movement on um, getting it towards car free? Um, question two is: You talked about the badges, but I don't think you came back about the um, bats. Um, if you could come back with the um, on the bat issue. And third question: The Surbiton Cons Conservation Area Advisory Committee point six on the report um, was worrying about sort of if the. Um, um, there was a piecemeal development and there was a, a hoping for a section 106 agreement to try and resolve that. Is there any sort of um, appetite to either produce a section 106 agreement to allay, allay, alleviate their concerns or to accept conditions which would come to much the same things? Would you like to um, take those questions? Yeah. Was there another badger issue then? Yeah, um, just with response to the bats, um, we've, we've done lots of bat surveys on site, and there, there is a good diversity of bats on site in comparison to you know most urbanised areas. Um, there was a single myotis bat that flew through, so that's why 
we've been retaining as many of the large trees as possible. Most of the trees that are being retained are the high potential batteries. So the, the, some of the larger oaks that have got some big tree features. We've not climbed every single tree on site because there's no need to, because they're all being retained. And the focus of the scheme is very much on minimizing the lighting impacts of the scheme. So low level lighting. Um, again, the lighting strategy is gonna be reviewed again with the landscape architects from an ecological perspective. Um, just to ensure that we're keeping that to a minimum. Um, any roosting crevices that are being lost as part of the removal of uh, some of the kind of low and moderate potential trees that we found, um, we're replacing lots of roosting crevices with bat boxes on retained trees and also with some kind of bespoke integrated features into uh, the new buildings. And so all of the new buildings being built, built have got integrated uh, wooden cladding features that are suitable for pipistrel bats and also sometimes myotis use them as well. Um, so we think we've got the bat thing fairly well covered. Uh, we are bat specialists at Darwin Ecology and uh, we make sure that our mitigation is very meaningful and we also you know, do it really well when it comes round to getting the site built, we will be on site and we'll supervise those features going in. Um, was there a specific point about badges that I missed then? Or uh, no. Oh, sorry, yeah. You, 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 you'd covered badges, but you hadn't covered bats. Yeah. That, that, that was... in, in addition to that, the, obviously the, the underground tunnel enhancement for bats as well uh, will be fine. The whole planting scheme is going to benefit bats because we've got lots of wildflower mix going in. At the moment, the kind of dominated domination of cherry laurel is very unsuitable for bats and invertebrates. So we're hoping that the new planting mix and the kind of more open canopy, but whilst retaining the large trees, will actually be a really good foraging habitat for bats. Um, added to that, we've got green roofs, um, you know, in a couple of places on site as well. So we're, we're really doing our best here. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, yeah. Sorry, just briefly on parking. Um, yeah, in terms of parking spaces, we've got 10 for the new residential, which is 10 spaces for 34 units, and 10 for the new college. So just dealing with the new college at the moment, or reversing a little bit, that's actually less parking than is on site at the moment, so we're proposing less parking. In terms of the new college, there's 10 spaces proposed, two of those are disabled, and there is a certain amount of parking needed by the college. What we're proposing is probably less than ideally they'd want. And that is to cater for a number of staff that go between their two college sites, teaching at more than one site in the same day. There's also need for um, maintenance workers as a team of four or five with their own cars, vans that go between the two sites. And also IT, you know, audio visual uh, team as well that go between the two sites. So. There is um, a need for those spaces with the new college. In terms of the residential, as I say, it's, it's 10 spaces for 34 units. Two of those are accessible. We're at the moment looking at some amendments to the scheme that will increase the number of accessible spaces there to three. And we're also looking at revising the mix of units, i.e. We're, we're looking to incorporate a greater number of three bed units, as has been requested by officers. And with those three bed units, um, there's a greater need for parking. So if we were sticking out the predominantly one and two bed scheme, we probably would lose some parking. But because now we're, we're significantly increasing the three bed units, um, we're maintaining the parking levels that we're at. And just in terms of the um, reference to piecemeal development, officers of the council have been very clear that this development needs to be um, buttoned down very carefully via 106 to ins ensure the correct sequencing of works on site and um, effectively building, disposal, occupation of the various elements. So that will certainly be fully covered off. Okay. Um, Councillor Sheba. Thank you, Chair. I've just got hopefully three quick questions. The first one is um, in the centre of the... Um, I've, I've got... A, you know, this map, I've been plotting out the TPOs on, on this map. Um, so my first question is, in the centre where you've got the abundance of green, what looks like green grassed area, um, I couldn't quite work out whether any trees were originally there or is that an existing open space? So that's my first question. 
because um, I'd like to get a better sense of whether there are any trees that are going to be removed or is that an existing area of, of grass. Um, yeah, that's just, this is from, just from all the plans that we've got in front of us. The area to the south of the building, um, with South Bank being at the top, uh, this area of, of open grass, what looks like open grassland in the middle, um, I'm just interested to know if any trees are there now, or if the, or if, if there are going to be any remove uh, any due to, in your plan to be removed. Um, wasn't I didn't think there were, but I just wanted a quick clarification well, on that. You can yeah finish your question. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, the second is looking at the. Um, I'm mean, really intrigued by the design because looking at the oh, the listed building. Um, to the north, to South Bank. Um, it, you've gone to so much trouble in, in this application to soften a lot of the exterior area around the perimeter of the whole site. It just seems such a shame from this design that you've now got this sort of um, area um, to the top right, northeast area, where there's just literally nothing um, no, no, no sort of greenery, no trees it appears from the design. It just seems a bit odd that you know, obviously you've gone to so much trouble elsewhere to retain all the trees that you haven't thought about actually enhancing that section of the site. Um, so that was just an observation. I'm just my question is, you know, whether actually you, uh, was that the area where you'd um, going to remove trees. I wasn't. I couldn't quite see from the design if there are any trees that, that sit there now. And just the last question is again on the other side where the car park is situated. I just wasn't clear whether there are any existing trees that you would need to remove um, to put the car park in. And again, it just seems such an absolute shame that you've gone to so much trouble elsewhere, but you've you've sort of. Um, sort of left it open with not with just with cars presumably you that will be you know hard surfaced area for car parking but you hadn't actually softened it and particularly the comments from one of the residents I'm apologies I've forgotten your name yeah. you know that actually you know it, it's such a shame in, in in these sort of corners of the <laughs> of this application where really I think it it would have been um it would have just softened the overall look and feel of it. And so I'm just, my, they, they are my three questions, really the reasoning behind what, what, why you've done what you've done in the plan. I wondered if you could come back to me on those three questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Right, the first question about trees. Um, I hope you can see this plan. This plan shows exactly all the trees on site, the ones we are retaining, the ones we are removing, in, and the different categories. So I hope that answers the question. So to the northwest of the site, when the car park is, Yes, we are removing few trees there, which are class C and mainly sycamore and, and low quality trees. And then we have five where the new college is, which are again uh, category B trees and sycamore. Then my colleague before mentioned the 43 uh, small holly and sycamore trees removed where their new residential building is going to be. It was just in relation to the two areas, the, the three areas, really. It was more to understand why you would felt that the Category C could be removed, actually, if it didn't have heavy roots or if there was a root issue. If I was parking my car, I would quite like to have some shade. So I'm just really intrigued as to why you think it would be necessary to remove those trees in the... Uh, northwest of the site where actually you could benefit from some extra biodiversity even if you're parking your car or other you know it, it doesn't have to be an open well, car park and that, that I, I understand answer the question now then yeah, yeah I, I, I totally understand your yeah. question of yeah course, i didn't really understand where we have the a car park, we need an access for, yeah. for cars right 
of course, any tree we can retain, we will. Yeah. It's not that we just want to remove trees. Uh, I want to make this point clear. If during uh, more detail of the sign we see, as we see now, you know, there was 334 that was done for removal, but doing additional surveys, uh, surveys, we realize that it's a tree that we can retain. We are really doing that. As I said, if we recognize when we do further design that we can retain more trees than what we're doing, we will do it. Right, okay. I might come back just to a comment later, but yeah, no, I think I think you probably answered the question about, but I still didn't quite get um, the answer. Chief, that can we all. just finish it now then, because we can yeah. move on? If you've finished your questions, can we... And then I'll, yeah. we'll go to a comment later. Yeah, that's okay. fine. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Oh, I'm not, oh, yeah, this one. Um, no, I'm not doing it. Um, I'm not putting my mic on. Um, okay, so I think if we finished the council questions, uh, we can move on to any comments we might have. We've uh, finished with the questions for the applicant. Are there any comments any councillors would like to make? No? Nobody's wanted to make any comments. Um, I probably would quite like to make some comments then, if nobody else is. Um, Right. Um, so, so, so for for me, this is actually um, my ward, and I um, and and um, and I'm very aware that it, within Surbiton Hill Ward, we don't have a lot of green space, and and the green space that we're looking at um, is is one of the main bits, and and then there's the woods next to it, and 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 the Richard Jeffries, which is is a, is great to have them in, and so so for me, uh, my my feeling is I'm I, I'm listening to what you said, and and the research that you've done I'm, I'm you know that you have done all the, the looking at the bats you're making sure that they're not going to be disturbed and that you're going through all the process of the licenses that you require and all, all of those um, things and that the bats are not impacted because you know for me it's about it's losing the green spaces but it's also increasing the light and bats and light uh, particularly depending on what kind of species of, of bats is, is really important. So, so I, I do hope that, you know, I've listened to what you said and I, I know that the planning um, committee will hopefully look at this as well because it, it is such, um, you know, a treasured site and I'm particularly um, keen to, uh, to with, with the, the um, Richard Jeffries um, sanctuary and, and the wood next to it because I do see it as a corridor and, and I think we, we must keep that in, in mind when, when you're looking at it. I do have some concerns about there not being any affordable. I, I hear what you're saying about it, it that you're, you're, well, I would say you, that the college is a community asset, which I'd absolutely agree. It's a great asset. It's been there for a very long time. It was, a, a, it was a educating women when, when women were not getting um, education. So I absolutely, uh, totally agree that, um, you know, that that, that is a, a community asset that we would like to see. My concerns are that um, it's really surrounding and what comes first? So, so do are we going to um, build the the um, the new facility, the the new college, before you move on to renovating the house? And and will you enter into a, a legal agreement with the council uh, to make sure that that does happen? Because that will, is the concerns. I think you've heard it this evening, uh, and I, and that's how, what I feel is that you know we do need to have some certainty about the whole site. And that it's not going to be, um, that, that it's, and, and that needs to be, I think, needs to be done through some sort of legal um, arrangement with with the planning um, that will be drafted by the planning department and looked over by the, the planning committee. I, I do obviously, like others have, have mentioned, about the loss of trees. I take on board your point about um, self seeding. Uh, we all have that in our garden. I've had sycamores and, and and hollies that have been uh, arrived that I didn't plant myself. But I, but I do think it's a, it's a mix. You know, you do have to make sure it's mixed and it's maintained, um, and that's probably for for me. So even putting in, if you're going to do the meadow grass, it still has to be maintained, and, and I just want to make sure that you have that in your program um, to to maintain it and 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 keep it so that the, the that, that we can have a biodiversity uh, net gain and, and, and you know and increase uh, and and keep what what's there. So so for the, the that's my um, comments on on this. I don't um, when I've looked at 
at the plans, I think you have tried very hard to, to um, settle it in into it. I, I, uh, it's a pers completely personal thing, and I'm not on the planning committee. I, I, I quite like the, the building, and that's purely a, a personal thing. Um, I do like um, the new building that's there, but I do have some concerns about the whole thing, the whole site, and, 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 and how we're going to manage the, 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 the green space around it and, and, and adjoining it. So, so that's my comments. Is anybody, anyone else? On that basis, um, we will um, wrap that up. There is a number of comments have been made. I think I probably summarised quite a lot of them there. Um, but Fiona has been summarising. If we take that away and, and, and pass that on to the, the planning committee, that would be great. Um, and thank you very much for coming along to, you know, to explain what you're doing, the process you've gone through. Thank you to residents for coming along. This is just a part of the process. There is another stage, and, and you will be, if you've given um, your details to the council, then you will be told when it's coming to committing. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. So, uh, Are you still to deal with these items? Yes. Okay. Yes. James now. So, you can stay if you want. There's only just a little bit more of business, so you, do, you know. But I know that you've, it's been a long evening. All, the rest of the business is now councillor business. It's not really. Uh, it's, uh, and, but but there is some important stuff because our neighbourhood manager is going to give us a verbal update. So I think very quickly, James, just a little bit of a verbal update. Yes, thank you, Jay. I had a number of things, but I may just uh, shorten ever so slightly given the hour. Um, I did want to touch on. Um, Claremont Gardens. Um, last year, as you know, the committee agreed to fund a number of improvements to Claremont Gardens, and that work is about to start. Um, so the restoration of the wildlife pond will start on Monday, the 4th of July, and the work will take approximately 14 days. Um, this will restore the pond to enable it to support a functional ecosystem and array of species, including dragonflies, frogs, and newts. Um, I will be joined by Elliot and a couple of the rangers uh, the week before in Claremont Gardens, and we'll have a gazebo set up there, letting re res local residents know about the forthcoming works. Um, so following completion of that, hopefully it's all on time, um, the subsequent work will begin on the new pathways, benches, um, and uh, last but not least, the planting of the bio beds. Um, there is currently, for those still here, um, an electrical vehicle charging point consultation out. We're looking to put more of them in. Um, it's all available on the, web, on the website. That's kingstonletstalk.co.uk. Um, similarly, uh, our colleagues in the Heritage Service have their annual Capture Kingston competition. So every year, um, the, Kist, the History Centre with the Friends of Kingston Heritage Service run this photography competition, which is called Capture Kingston. Um, it's everyone's chance to contribute um, the, to the record of our borough. Um, the theme this year is movement, and there's a special prize for one, uh, the best photo that captures movement, um, and also a special prize for one that captures the Jubilee celebrations. And the deadline for entries is the 1st of September, and to find out more on how to enter, please visit kingstonheritage.org.uk. That's kingstonheritage.org.uk. Um, also in the weeks to come, um, we are doing a litter pick in the uh, aforementioned woods, um, which is, as we've learned this evening, um, the space um, by Hillcroft College. Um, that will be taking place um, on Saturday the 9th of July. The exact times are to be confirmed. But have, I'll be there, a couple of the rangers will be there. But if you'd like to get involved, please email me, and that's james.geach at kingston.gov.uk. Thank you, Jim. Mm. Great. Thank, thank you, James, um, for that update. And yes, we'll be um, joining all of those things. Uh, does any councillors have any comments on that? You're happy to hear? Okay, that's fine. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, so, um, if we move on to the um, next item on the agenda, which is neighbourhood working arrangements. I'm looking at the time, um, and I'm thinking, um, and I know Fiona's going to introduce it, but I'm just wondering if we could go quite swiftly and say that we're happy to continue with the arrangements we had before of not having um, a planning um, subcommittee, um, and, and, and that we... And that we will agree. <laughs> well, the only bit I was going to say that we will have a, a guillotine. We could put it at half ten, but given that we've not used it, do we want to have the guillotine set at half ten? That we can no, no guillotine. Okay, that's fine. Uh, you've heard it all here. So, so, so no, uh, uh, no planning sub, and and that's agreed unanimously, Fiona. If that's, do you need me to get it seconded? 
No? Okay, that's fine. Um, and so that's that item. Then it's just to note um, the, um, the work programme. There is a slight amendment to that because we've got King Charles and Berrylands, um, they're the one and the same. So we can just amend that to reflect that that will come back to committee on the other side of the summer. And and then, that don't think there's any urgent items? No urgent items. No I, no, uh, items for the chair. And that is us closing the meeting at Sorry. 11. I, just to be pedantic on the, um, the date is given as 17th of March, and it should be the 15th of June on Appendix D. You're very well, you're absolutely well, good sport, very well. So some of them are still awake. Um, that's quite good, yes. But still on 17th of March at the top of the page rather than, um, it, rather than, um, yep. Okay, yep. So, um, thank, thank you very much for pointing that out. And so, on that note, um, it's now 11.07 um, 11 um, and uh, close the meeting. Thank you very much, everybody, for your contributions.